speaker with the ACNS and ENS because uh, the guest speaker for today's uh, particular session is uh, Professor Andreas Demetrius, who is the president of uh, European Association of Neurological Surgeons. And the wine speaker is a young uh, uh, female neurosurgeon from Brazil, Dr. Glossia. Uh, to uh, chair this session, we have Professor Tariq Khan, who is uh, uh, expert and who's been uh, the uh, ex uh, chairperson for WFNS Neurotrauma uh, Committee and has done a lot of work, in, especially in the field of neurotrauma, is the best, best person to chair today's session. Uh, the discussions are uh, Professor Byron Salazar, who is the president of UK uh, Society of Neurological Surgeons, and uh, Professor Alexander Wozniak, who is the president of Ukrainian Society of Neurological Surgeons. Very soon, we're going to have two young neurosurgeons from uh, Ukraine uh, to join a short-term fellowship in uh, uh, in Nagoya in uh, Japan. So that's a very good thing. And uh, for, as a, our uh, patron, we have our uh, Professor Yoko Kato, the president of ACNS. To moderate this today's session, we have uh, Dr. Ben from Hong Kong, Dr. Sneha Chitra from India, Dr. Ablai uh, Serik Bey from uh, Kazakhstan, and Dr. Dulos from Kyrgyzstan. So before we start, I would request uh, uh, first Professor Yoko Kato to say a few opening remarks for the young neurosurgeon, and after that, uh, I would request Professor Tarin to say something about uh, uh, Professor uh, Andrew Dimitrius and about his topic today. And then we'll ask uh, Professor Andreas to uh, start his uh, presentation. So first, Professor Yoko Kato, please. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Professor Andreas as uh, the president of the ENS. And thank you very much for the just start the collaboration with ENS and uh, uh, the ENS uh, some activity. Uh, Albert Felitti, that he did a great effort. Maybe uh, at the beginning, maybe we can have some webinar with uh, ENS members. Uh, I'm very much looking for your lectures. Thank you very much. And also the Tariq. Uh, the good and all friends. Uh, my congratulations. Also, first WFS International Global the Neurosurgery Conference, which will be held in, in your place. So this is a real first one. It's a global neurosurgery conference. I think uh, the, uh, the conference will be successful uh, with your great effort. And today uh, we have so many uh, good uh, young doctors uh, attending. And also, of course, the Byron you know, from the uh, Ecuador. Uh, he is a great neurosurgeon, the, one of the representatives of Latin America with your father. And uh, maybe uh, SNS, of course, uh, the collaboration with uh, Latin America, especially Ecuador. Thank you so much. So we should start. Sachin? Yes, uh, I would request Professor Tariq Khan to say a few opening words about Professor Andreas and especially about today's topic, uh, about uh, the status of neurotrauma. Uh, in short, and then we'll go ahead with the uh, presentation. Professor Tariq Khan. Yeah, thank you very much, Sachin. Um, first of all, I must congratulate the ACNS for doing so many excellent webinars, uh, Professor Yoko and, and her team, Sachin, and all doing an excellent job. Um, so, uh, so the speaker, first one, Professor Andrews Demetrius, does not really need any introduction. Um, he's a very well-known consultant neurosurgeon and spine surgeon in Edinburgh, UK, and he's the president of EANS. Uh, he's going to talk uh, on this very important subject, something very near to my heart, on traumatic brain injury in 21st century Scotland, lessons from health population studies. Uh, so, Andrews, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very kind introductions. Too kind, perhaps. A uh, special thank you to Professor Yoko Kato, who is the patron of this uh, force of energy. The collaborations that are coming through are of huge importance and I'm very glad that we managed to put together the, the young neurosurgeons from the ACNS and the ENS so hopefully there will be more <clears throat> joint activities in the future both online and, and face to face. Uh, thank you Professor Tariq Khan for your very kind uh, introduction. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible without the background work from Sachin and Raja and the other panelists. So thank you very much indeed. I chose a topic that is perhaps not so sexy in the Western world, 
but it remains of huge importance. And, and Professor Khan has made seminal contributions to the global health side of neurotrauma, which uh, I would like to bring home a little bit. So we have the uh, following points to go through. It's not a very long presentation. I'll talk a little bit about the physical and geographical peculiarities of Scotland. And then I'll use some population studies we have to try and identify uh, some lessons uh, of epidemiology and beyond. I have no financial disclosures here. I can show you on the bottom left the uh, old Royal Infirmary, which is where um, brain trauma used to be treated very, very old, old days ago. And on the top right, the new Royal Infirmary where our department moved uh, for the last few years during the pandemic, in fact. Now, in the UK, we have a hub and spoke system of neurosurgery. It's all a tertiary level uh, centralized system. And there's only about 35 centers, uh, including Scotland. But in Scotland per se, we only have four centers of neurosurgery. Um, in order of size is Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, and Dundee. And you can see here that the terrain of, of Scotland is quite mountainous in the, in the left picture, which is not a surprise, therefore, that most of the settlements, towns, cities, and so on, are along the coast. Uh, and and within that area, we only have four major trauma centers and only four neurosurgical centers. You can see here, Edinburgh is on the East Coast. Glasgow is towards the West. Dundee is only about an hour away from Edinburgh and Aberdeen, uh, just over two hours from Edinburgh. But then of course it leaves quite a large area of so-called highlands and indeed the islands. Uh, which provides quite a challenging uh, trauma network coverage. On neurosurgery hospitals, you can see how that they, you know, they're distributed here uh, uh, in some green spot. Each of those have access to either by helicopter or by land ambulance and occasionally by sea ambulance. The first question we wanted to address through what's called the SABIN, the Scottish Acquired Brain Injury Network. This is an interdisciplinary network comprising surgeons, anesthetists, intensivists, rehabilitationists, physiotherapists, speech and language therapists. So it, so it follows the patients throughout the whole patient journey from the acute to the very chronic uh, point of time. Um, so we wanted to get some epidemiological data, and we know from contributions such as this that the incidence of traumatic brain injury is actually a, a global problem. It's a pandemic size problem. It is well-researched in areas where there is industrialization, but it's probably more prevalent in areas which are under-resourced. And we also have information from these now, I would say quite outdated map. I think this map needs to be somehow updated, but we can see that the proportion of neurosurgeons uh, is not necessarily matching where the prevalent trauma exists. Now, the last 10 years, or if you like the, the 2010 to 2019 decade, the admissions to hospital for head injury are shown in green. And you can, of course, there's a slight wave of up and down, but it's in the order of 9,000 or so per year. These are the number of admissions for head injuries. The population of Scotland is about five, 0.5 million. And then you can see the yellow underneath how many of those actually end up under neurosurgery because 
historically only those that will need an operation and or um, prolonged observation will, will go to a neurosurgical unit. So that number seems pretty steady uh, on the graph. And the lower number, which is those who die in hospital, so this is in hospital mortality, a um, small proportion, but again, steady over the last decade or so, slight increase in that. Now, if we look at the data that can be extracted from such population studies, it's not very granular, but this graph shows the hospital admissions with a diagnosis of traumatic brain injury over the period 2010 to 2019. And you can see that the light blue color is for the age group of 65 plus, where there's a clear increase year on year in the admissions. There's a small drop in 2019 because this was uh, delivered without all the data for 2019. Um, so if you ask for this data in 2020, and it took a couple of years for us to get it, um, then the data for the previous year is not necessarily fully comprehensive. So if you want 2020 data, you better ask for it in 2022 and so on. But there's a steady increase in the most vulnerable group. And if we also look at the male, female gender differences, I think those are fairly steady over the years and there's a slight fluctuation, but not significant. The, the other concern is that the, the rise is steady, slow but steady. Uh, and we looked at also a different data set called the Scottish Trauma Network data set. And again, the data, of course, is consistent that there is a gentle rise in the incidence of traumatic brain injury throughout the Scottish nation. And we're lucky in Scotland that we, that we do have linkage data and therefore it's possible with a bit of persistence to get such data. It's not as easy as it sounds, but eventually it's there. Now, this is an older study that looked at the epidemiology of head injury the decade before, from 2000 to 2010. And it looks at the for each episode. You can see in the box there that uh, they divided this into motor vehicle accidents, falls, and assault. These are not surprising trends. I think they reflect uh, very much the situation in Europe, uh, both in terms of the mechanism of injury, but also the, the age groups. So we then and looked again at the trend. And the trend that we can see here is that those in the blue, which is those in allegedly the most productive years of life. I, <laughs> this is how the epidemiologists call 16 to 44. But anyway, this is the younger productive years, I would say, because arguably 45 to 54 and 55 to 64 and so on are equally very productive and perhaps more experienced years. But the trends of annual percentage change are that all age groups are showing an incident, an increasing in, in incidence. If you, if you do special analytics, even though the generic trends had a gentle decline, according to this, uh, we should be mindful that there is an annual percentage change which shows a positive trend in the incidence. We also looked at the injury severity and the length of stay. And we can see that those who stay less than two days in hospital at the top bar are mostly those with a major injury. That's not a surprise, of course, because unfortunately they will probably not survive. Uh, but then those that stay up to a week or two weeks or more than two weeks, the dynamic changes, you can see how people move from one group into another. And in the end, as predicted, there is a large proportion who have a severe injury or, and or a moderate injury, which means that um, this is a, a public health resource that needs, also, that needs monitoring. We look at the survival outcomes too. And for these here, I show you 
on the left um, all injury types, that means the following three. So if we look in the second box here, the outcomes of all head injuries in the study period uh, were 84% survival. We also look, compared it to spinal injury alone, and the survival rate is 96%. And patients, this is part of a separate project. But if we look at concomitant and spinal injuries, the mortality rate jumps quite significantly to 24%, and the survival rate drops quite significantly, significantly to 75%. Now, these outcomes are very binary. It's a simple alive or dead question, and they do not include neurocognitive outcomes. And I think this is a huge gap in the literature for traumatic brain injuries, certainly here, but perhaps also um, internationally that we do not really know how well our patients are doing in the long term and in the chronic side of things after a, a moderate or a severe or indeed a mild injury because mild injuries can be quite easy to dismiss from the acute services but we don't know how well these patients do professionally down the line. So we then try to identify whether there's any socioeconomic relevance to our data. And in Scotland, we have something called the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, which is a surrogate for socioeconomic disparities. And it's divided in five quintiles. Quintile one, which is gonna be in blue color in the following pictures, is the most deprived. And quintile five is the least deprived. So I'll show you here how this graph looks at traumatic brain injury hospital admissions over the period 2010 to 2019, only looking at the, the, the social disparities index, the Scottish index of multiple deprivation. And clearly we have uh, quintile one, the blue, which is the most deprived at the highest level of incidence, the highest number of admissions. And the trend continues to be uh, increasing. The, the green is the least deprived, and those are the most fortunate in that they have the smallest incidence per annum, but also uh, the slowest rate of increase. The yellow number at the bottom is simply those who were undeclared. So basically, worryingly, the most deprived have the higher number of the higher incidence of uh, traumatic brain injury per annum, but also the most uh, increasing trend of head injuries. And then if we look at the severity, major, moderate, or minor, again, per this uh, index of deprivation, number one, the most deprived have the biggest number of head injuries in all subgroups. So this confirms, as previously described by others, that the most deprived are the most vulnerable in TBI. Now, I accept that this is very, um, this epidemiological data is useful, but it does not address the granularity. And we have tried to identify specific data sets that we can then use, hopefully, to get some more specific information. We do need to get some socioeconomic input for some socioeconomic disparity analysis. And we do need to link with non-neurosurgeons in government and policy organizations where the implications of health economics and the implications on the distribution of services, especially in a geographically challenging terrain such as Scotland can be uh, reorganized perhaps or definitely optimized. So in summary, during this small talk, I just wanted to share with you that uh, TBI remains a problem throughout the world, even in so-called industrialized nations. Scotland has a challenging geographical terrain. The TBI management can be challenging, 
both because of geography, but also because of resources. And we can make an impact. Uh, this is a different kind of research doing population studies, but we can show and raise alarm that the incidence of TBI is increasing. It is particularly rising in the elderly group of citizens. It is particularly associated with social deprivation and alarmingly, socioeconomic disparities remain unexplored or relatively unexplored in this particular area. Um, basically, I wanted to leave it there, invite you to Scotland whenever we have a, a next event, I will let you know. And don't forget that we would like to meet with you face to face in our, in our next Congress in Barcelona, it's at the end of September. And the abstracts are, the deadline is in a couple of days. So please, if you have any studies that you want to, to share with us, go onto our website, ens.org, or the, and from there to the website for the Congress and do submit your abstracts. So thank you again for your kind invitation. And uh, congratulations for the hard work from the young neurosurgeons of the ACNS. Thank you very much, Andres, for a very insightful, excellent presentation. Um, I think if you can shed some light on this important aspect of uh, in lower and middle income countries, we are seeing more and more a younger population uh, with TBIs as compared to Europe, United States, and Japan as well, where more of an elderly population uh, is facing falls in TBIs, especially those people who are on aspirin or blood thinners as well. So maybe you can give us a little thing on that. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. Yes, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I think uh, part of it is because we have an increasingly a uh, bigger proportion of the elderly in our population. I think the survival is simply increasing. And these populations, and that's going to be all of us in, in the future, we have outlived previous generations. And this will, of course, will normalize to a certain point. But I remember when I began training, it used to be said that, that if you have a patient with a head injury, over 70 you wouldn't touch them but if you say this now people would raise an eyebrow even though they still say it for those over 80. Um, but i think i think that reflects the age of the consultants who are treating this patient so the so a, a colleague of mine said that uh, it depends if they are same age as my parents i would treat them <laughs> but as my parents grow i change my mind and but I think it's partly because we have an aging population in Europe uh, and the UK too, uh, and who are vulnerable to falls. Maybe also we see a lot here the, the risks in the winter with uh, slippery icy surfaces. Uh, people like going on walks. So falling is definitely a major problem uh, for the elderly. Now the younger generation we still have a, it's just that the percentage increase was not as visible, but there is still an increase uh, overall, to be honest. And maybe, maybe the trends you have in, in, other, in other parts of the world are an opportunity to compare and contrast and maybe, maybe learn from each other. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, okay, Sachin, maybe you want to take over? Thank you. I think Byron has raised his hand there. Maybe you want to say something? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, to congratulate uh, Professor Dimitri for an excellent lecture. Um, I think the problem, uh, at least for us, for Latin American uh, people, is the epidemiological data and the publications about TBI. Because uh, we have a problem that maybe there is an underreporting TBI problem cases because in our environment, because maybe mild TBI cases are not reported, or maybe there is no interest in publishing unfavorably uh, statistical data, or maybe there is the difficulty of creating databases that uh, from incomplete physical and medical records. 
So actually, this underreporting, uh, it's well known, uh, for example, in this review that was published in the Neurosurgical Focus around 2019, that, for example, we have in Latin America uh, around 5.8 million cases of TBI, while in Europe, they maybe have like a, a 9 uh, million cases. And they report and, and publish uh, that we make as Latin Americans around a year, it's like maybe 14 publications, while in Europe, or uh, they have like maybe 200. So this uh, means at least for us that there are so many cases that we actually don't know, and we actually do not know the natural history of the disease. So uh, when we compare the, the, the statistics, uh, I think we are getting two shirts about uh, how many people really are dying or maybe hey, how many people have like uh, some motor, some uh, difficulties, some sequels about this disease, which would represent, you know, a, a, a lot of uh, money that we have to pay for rehabilitation, that they can't work, they affect their family and so on. So I guess that would be a, a joint effort you know, from all the, the great societies like, like Europe that have a lot of experience and, of course, uh, the Asian community that we could actually make a, a, some new databases so that actually are uh, easy to fulfill so we can create a, a good profile about how really the, the trauma the TBI is, is affecting our society. And, of course, here in Latin America, we have the problems with adults and it increases in, in the young people, in yeah. the TBI, in, in people around maybe less than 12 years old. We do not see anything, almost anything, because uh, that part of the population it's go, goes to different uh, pediatric hospitals. And I don't know why, but we haven't. Oh, we do not have a, a proper database to actually see all the the meaningful data that could, could report for the society. And Thanks. that's about and it. Thank you very I, much. I, th I think uh, some important work is being done by the NHIR, NIHR group from Cambridge, from Peter Hutchinson on GeoTBI and uh, Genos Spine, where they're collecting data from many, many countries. I think that might be very helpful. Professor Yoko? Yes, thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Andreas. A wonderful lecture. Just I want to ask, uh, can we expect or the patient, the prognosis, uh, if the patient has a very severe head injury, so what is a good or appropriate the image or just let us know your suggestion, please. Thank you. Thank you, Yoko. Do, do you mean prognostics? Yes. How do we... Yes, that's. I think it's a very difficult uh, subject. I don't think anyone has nailed prognosis at the point of treatment delivery and the decision of it, because also here, you know, every week, if you if we decide to operate on someone who's elderly or not, or or a so-called active person who, let's say, plays golf every week or plays bridge every week. Um, there's always resistance from other colleagues in intensive care, anesthetics, etc., saying, oh, I predict this will not be a good thing. So there has to be a balance between nihilistic attitudes where we don't treat anyone above a certain age versus more realistic uh, mechanisms, which we need to come up with that include the physiology of the patient, the frailty um, and some prognostic parameters from the severity of the injury, not just the head injury, but also the, the injury severity score uh, uh, and other physiological parameters. I don't think we have good predict predictive models. There is the crash model, which uh, if you were to follow it fully, some patients would definitely not uh, be given a fair chance. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential for statistical, high level statistical work. The problem is of course, the quality of data you put in, because the quality of data we put in will determine the quality of the, of the predictive modeling. And, and, 
given that artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on are becoming so popular, I am sure we will we will see a lot more prognostics being developed. But the caution should be that we make sure the quality of the data that goes in is top notch. Otherwise, we will be making unnecessary uh, judgment calls that could jeopardize the survival of some patients. Okay, so I'm kind of having haven't given you a very specific answer, but I think that those are my my thoughts at the moment. I hope that answers that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So, uh, Sachin, you want to take over? Thank you. I think there are a few other hands up. Hello. Maybe Albert or Ikechan. I think Dr. Uh, Ikechuku uh, is uh, the first one who should talk. Ikechuku, please. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. About this for this opportunity to present to contribute in this presentation. Thank you, Professor Yoko for all you do. Thank you, Professor Demasrai, for this interesting and lucid presentation on traumatic brain injury. Yeah, traumatic brain injury is an epidemic. And this epidemic is what? In response to a country like mine. For my interest is in your presentation, that this graph that showed a gentle and persistent rise. And six at 2019, that's the incidence of traumatic brain injury, six at 2019. So they are just sub drop to 2020. So, what would be responsible? I'm just curious. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Anyaku. Uh, I didn't have a very good connection. Let me confirm I understood the question. You're asking about why there was a drop between 19 and 20? Yes, sir. there's this increase in incidence of CBI. It was a gentle and persistent uh, rise and peaked at 2019. And with this sharp drop in 2019, I don't know whether you can see that graph. So I'm just curious what could be responsible for this sharp drop in the yes. incidence? Yes, sir. Thank, thank you for that. I will show you again that specific graph because I think you're referring to this thing here, right? No, sir. No, not, not the particular one, sir. But uh, the, the drop... Okay, but... but I, the, the drop of 2020 is artificial because I spoke to the epidemiology statistics group and because this data was uh, requested in 2020... And of course it took, and this is the, the reality was that at that time was the pandemic. So data like this was not prioritized until much later, but the collection of the 2019, sorry, the submission of data for 2019 usually finishes during the year of 2020. And because this data was collected or authorized in 2020, it is believed that the data of 2019 is incomplete. So in theory, we could ignore the drop in 2019 to, yeah, in 2019, ignore this drop and request a repeat of the calculation for, from that period at a later time. So basically, this drop, according to the, the analytics experts, the data analysts, is artificial because 2020 is still a period during which data for 2019 is being collected, analyzed, verified, and so on. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. You're welcome. Good question. Thank you. So, Albert? Uh, yes. Thank you, Professor Dimitriades, for a very nice talk. Uh, it's good to see you again. Um, 
I think actually um, studies, epidemiological studies always offer a nice uh, uh, window on reality. So they are very interesting. And there are actually two things that catch my attention in your talk. The first one is about uh, socioeconomic disparities and the fact that, as you said, the most deprived are the most vulnerable to traumatic injury. So, of course, uh, there must be uh, many reasons uh, to explain this fact. But uh, I would like to know, in your opinion, if uh, this uh, difference can be uh, due uh, just to the fact that the people uh, with lower socioeconomic level are more... uh, uh, exposed to traumatic injury, or is it also because they have less access to healthcare after uh, getting injured? So, uh, I, of course, this depends on single countries, right? Uh, but I would like a comment about this from you, especially uh, regarding the situation of UK or Scotland and differences with other countries, maybe developing countries. And the second uh, thing that catch my attention is about neurocognitive outcome. Uh, actually, this is something we always uh, uh, tend to not to consider, let's say, because we we always focus on the functional outcome, uh, thinking about uh, motor deficits or uh, or something more evident, more obvious. But uh, uh, increasing data and evidence. Uh, tells us that we have also this kind of problem in our patients. So so from a neurocognitive point of view, of course, it's difficult to uh, make good studies because we can assess neurocognitive uh, uh, level of our patients only after the injury. We we don't have the uh, pre-traumatic neurocognitive uh, status. But my question is about rehabilitation. We have a problem in my country, in Italy, uh, based on the fact that... uh, rehabilitation departments uh, tend to uh, admit patients uh, with motor deficits. Uh, It's more difficult to find a spot for patients uh, who don't have motor deficit, but maybe they have neurocognitive deficit. So I would like to know the situation in uh, in Scotland and uh, comment about this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Good to see you two again. Um, and thank you for the very important questions. I'll, I'll answer them in reverse. First, the rehab. The situation here in rehab is, is not great because there are not as many funded available places uh, for acute neuro rehab as there are patients requiring it. And this is partly why the network that I'm chairing, the Sabin network, the Scottish Acquired Brain Injury Network, this is why it exists and this is why it is mostly non-surgical. Because it, I think, and I think all of you will appreciate that when the patient has a head injury, the emergency services that take that patient to hospital work fairly well, if not very well here. Uh, the acute investigation in the emergency department it works extremely well. The neurosurgical services are available immediately. Neurointensive care is available. And from that point on, the, from the point of discharge from the intensive care units, which is the time when someone is eligible for neuro rehab, from that point onwards, the situation is very different. The funding is poor, the availability is short, the competition for places is high, and you're right, different areas have different screening methods. And one of them is if there is no motor deficit, let them go home and we'll see them in the community, which also means that there is no regular access once you're in the community because the physiotherapists, the speech and language therapists, the occupational therapists are usually busy with more serious cases. So if, if one measure is motor deficit, that means that we are giving attention to the motor deficits, but not the cognitive outcome. We have this problem too. It's a well-known problem throughout the UK and Scotland in particular. 
because I'm presenting Scottish uh, on behalf of Scottish uh, colleagues. Um, we don't have a solution um, because simply there are not the not required number of of inpatient hospital beds for rehab, uh, and this goes for spinal cord injury too. You know, in other words, rehab places are far a few between. Rehab consultants are often not enough. And there's also a recruitment uh, challenge in that some people don't want to come and work in rehab places. I don't know how it is in other countries, but rehabilitation positions uh, are quite challenging to fill, uh, fill up. And that is not an easy problem to change. How do we move on from that? Maybe with advocacy at the government level stage, uh, which again is difficult because you have to deal with parliament and politics and that's not our natural environment. Um, I can tell you, for example, that we have um, extremely well uh, organized community nursing support for conditions like motor neuron disease, which is a much rarer condition. Uh, so, so the support is much well represented, maybe 100 times better, if not more. But for head injury and the cognitive side of things, this is almost non-existent. As for the other question, which I also uh, find very challenging, the social disparity. I agree with you, Alberto. The people who are deprived of social circumstances are probably more likely to, to be exposed to trauma in general because of the jobs they do. They're more likely to do manual jobs. They're more likely to take risky jobs. They're more likely to go um, at a younger age out of school and and do jobs that uh, include risks of falls and machinery and so on. So I think it's a multifactorial problem. Uh, certainly they may, at, at, the, at the very severe injury stage, they will present because occupational accidents or severe accidents always receive attention. But if it's a mild to moderate event that takes place at work, there are there are parts of the population who will not seek advice, who do not feel they should go to the doctor or the hospital. So I think there's a multifactorial social issue there um, that in TBI remains relatively unexplored, at least in the Scottish setting. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Ben? Yes. Um, hello, I'm uh, uh, Dr. Ben from Hong Kong of the Young Liberal Surgeon. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Andreas, for your uh, quick sharing. And uh, first of all, congratulations on your result. And I think the epidemiological and also head injury study is very important. Because as a young neurosurgeon, we are facing a lot of uh, uh, head injury cases. And uh, I would firstly like to echo with uh, uh, you and also the other panel's opinion that, for example, for the uh, we are facing an, uh, an uh, uh, aging population that um, we have many uh, elderly who have uh, severe head injury that, that, uh, that we need to decide whether to operate on or not. Personally, I think that uh, if the patient uh, deteriorate from the um, uh, uh, good GCS, and then uh, with a uh, with a mainly or purely uh, extra extra hematoma, either is epidural or subdural, uh, without um, without much uh, intraparenchymal injury like contusion, then uh, usually this uh, would achieve a quite uh, achieve a better outcome, and uh, this uh, something that I usually consider during uh, my routine practice. Well, uh, how to talk to the relatives. Another thing is about um, uh, this day we can use some uh, prognostic uh, indicator, for example, the TPI impact um, calculator that uh, we might somehow find it useful when communicating to the relatives. And also 
is also about the medical legal issue. Uh, uh, in 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 uh, communicating with the relatives, and um, and also uh, how you respond uh, to the uh, to the society, and uh, and yeah, this and also my um, first question is about uh, that I will uh, ask Professor or the panelists that uh, whether in in those severe head injury with the brain that is grossly um, swollen and you operate on it, would you uh, perform the uh, cystinostomy? Um, personally, I, I, I sometimes, I, I started to perform a cystinostomy and I'm not an expert on it. Maybe a professor, uh, Charian, uh, who have peers sharing about it. I personally find it that uh, the ICP after cystinostomy might be a uh, better control uh, 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 compared with my uh, previous um, uh, uh, clinical experience. Not uh, evident based in my in my series, but uh, somehow I found that the ICP was a more manageable. And um, may I, what was your opinion on that as well? Thank you so much. Well, I can answer partly, Ben, that I, I agree with you that some of the, the criteria you have mentioned are the criteria that everyone uses, of course. Uh, you know, in, in an elderly patient scan, if you have only extraxial uh, blood without parenchymal injury, that's certainly a good, uh, a better, not a good, but a better um, situation than if you had also parenchymal injury uh, and uh, so on. Now, for cystinostomy, I cannot answer you because it's not something we do here um, in Scotland, and I think the, most of the UK is not something that has gained popularity. Uh, but I am not someone who can answer that question for that bit. And I think just add a bit. Uh, yeah, uh, just you mentioned uh, about the age maybe 70. So I sometimes operate on uh, um, early extra, extra hematoma that I find that the result is uh, still acceptable. So uh, it's just my uh, sharing on my, of my clinical experience. Yes, I agree. I don't think we should go by numbers, really. I think a patient who is 80 or 90 can be equally fit as someone who is uh, 50 or 60. So I think a frailty and a physiological assessment is more realistic than just a, a number of age. Yes, exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Sachin, please. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, yes, Dr. Ablai Sarik Bey. You have a hand raised. Please introduce yourself and ask your doubt. Yeah, um, Professor Dimitriadis, thank you uh, very much for your uh, such an interesting presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Ablas Irkbay. I'm a neurosurgeon from Kazakhstan. I'm a neurosurgeon. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for such an interesting um, presentation. I think. Um, this information will be uh, very useful for um, uh, for everyone, and especially for young neurosurgeons, because um, it's maybe uh, more often that uh, young neurosurgeons uh, work with uh, TBI, yes. and also in uh, our country. Also, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Abilai. Very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Abilai. Uh, any guest, Dr. Yusra from Pakistan. Dr. Yusra, please introduce yourself and ask it out. Uh, Dr. Yusra, I can see your hand raised. You have any question or any comment to make? Okay, maybe we're not able to hear her. So 
are there any other comment or any uh, question from anybody from the panelists for discussion <clears throat> hi can you hear me now yes dr isra please introduce hi. yourself and make yeah comment. i'm one of the young neurosurgeon from pakistan and uh, i would like to know since in pakistan um, there is no cognitive assessment available mm -hmm. it's usually motor sensory so um, as far as i know in uk they do West meet PTA assessments. So can we add that to um, the usual, you know, um, the patient chart so it can happen on daily basis with the patients because we do not have occupational therapists here. Can it happen in the countries where the occupational therapy is really not in every hospital? Thank you, Dr. Yusra. I mean, you're raising an important issue of resources and and, and uh, access to specialty assessments. Um, I don't know, I have mixed feelings about that because you as a neurosurgeon, you're, you're not necessarily uh, meant to compensate and start doing things which are outside your remit. Um, and doing assessments which are not necessarily expected of a, of a neurosurgeon per se. Uh, but it is an opportunity to, to find out how you can build that into your system. I don't think you need to do it every day. You don't need to fill in charts every day for something that doesn't change every day. I mean, there's the consciousness assessment that is done in the acute setting. But the cognitive assessment can be done at the late. Uh, it can be done as an inpatient, but then at regular intervals afterwards, also uh, as an outpatient. And the question is how and who in your in your system or in your network can be employed or trained to do that. Is it a doctor of rehab? Is it a physiotherapist? Is it an occupational therapist? Is it a rehabilitation doctor? So I don't think it's necessarily something that neurosurgeons should do, and perhaps it's more objective that they don't do it. That, that's my thinking. Tarek, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's a very important point, and I wonder if one can look at it at the time of discharge and after six months, yeah. where you're doing an outcome extended score. I think it would be a very good study to do, at least. Uh, I think I, I personally would look into it anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yusra, for actively participating. Maybe you can conduct that study proposed by Professor Tariq Khan. Yes, Dr. Andreas, you want to? Yes, Ashin, you, you took the words out of my mouth. Maybe we can encourage Dr. Yusra to do that small pilot project with Professor Khan and, and share the, the data that pre presented to us in the future. That would be great. Sure. sure. Yeah, look, look forward to hearing from you, Yusra. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I can see hand raised by Professor Fawad Bilzat, uh, who's the uh, president of Afghanistan Society of Neurosurgery. Yes, Professor Fawad, please, please make your comment. Okay. Hello. Uh, Konnichiwa. Salam alaikum. Uh, Professor Kato, Professor Tarakhan, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Andrea. Uh, for your nice presentation. Uh, we also have an Afghanistan that's increasing the head injury cases a lot. And uh, uh, also we have uh, world wound injury in uh, our country. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't also near a rehabilitation center. Uh, uh, and uh, it's uh, very important for near rehabilitation. And uh, uh, for this reason, we, we have a lot of uh, shortcomings in uh, here, and, and uh, it was uh, you uh, mentioned good points about uh, the governments for supporting the uh, rehabilitation and new rehabilitation center. It's it's very important. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Professor Pizar. It's a uh, it's. I'm very grateful that you've taken time of your busy schedule to, to join us. Thank you so much. It's an honor to meet all of you. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. These are, these are topics where we can exchange the information and the knowledge we have, but it's always, it's always a piece on the puzzle 
and we can learn from each other. Um, there's certainly a lot of puzzle pieces missing here. Uh, and I'm just sharing only a couple from, from Scotland. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fawad Um uh, Are there any comments uh, or any questions from anybody else? Uh, so if not, uh, I will ask one last question before we move on to the next topic because uh, definitely and indeed a great presentation by Professor Andrea Demetrius. Uh, trauma, especially the head trauma, will always uh, will continue to be one of the major problems, especially in low and middle income countries. And uh, Professor, may I ask you, like, since uh, Sisternos for me is coming up and is being highly debated in many of the conferences, many people uh, uh, very uh, positively promote it. In your opinion, what do you think will be the position of Sisternos for me in terms of its uh, its utility in surgeries and uh, in terms of uh, 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 bringing the infrastructure of which needed to perform the system for me, I mean, in terms of microscope and micro instruments, how do you see the uh, the, uh, the future of system for me in the middle and low income countries, your opinion, Professor? Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting topic and it has uh, increasing popularity. It seems to be a hot topic of discussion. Uh, to be fair, I'm not the right person to answer it because I, I don't routinely use it and therefore it would be unfair to pass judgment. All I would say is that when a new treatment or a new component of treatment is being proposed, um, we then need to look at the data and I think there is supportive data behind it. But going to the next stage would be to organize a well designed and a well-planned comparative study to assess its effect. So, so we need to minimize the bias in such studies and give it a very fair opportunity to, to assess its effect. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it not as good as people say? Is it better than what people say? But to answer such questions, we need well-designed studies which minimize uh, the limitations. And therefore, that's the only way we're going to solve this debate, I think. Yes, but, thank you. Thank you very much. For your comment. I think Dr. Biden wants to uh, add his uh, uh, comments to this hot topic. Yeah, Dr. just a, a, a quick comment that for Sister Nostomy, I have a, a very small series, like maybe 10 patients that, you know, actually. I saw that it can help. It is helpful. Uh, with 10 patients, of course, we cannot say if it, it's the future or not. I guess from my understanding, the future will be the biomarkers in TDI, the brain oxygen monitoring, the brain flow monitoring, maybe Emodex. So maybe at least for me, that's where actually the future is because if we are really true with ourselves in in brain trauma situations, the OR, uh, most of them don't have any microscope. And, you know, after all the care that we have in a swollen brain, always the brain gets hurt uh, with the manipulation. So it's not a nice surgery. Maybe it's practical at, at some point, but, you know, always the brain gets hurt. The, the frontal lobe is retracted. Sometimes we even have to aspirate a little bit of the frontal brain, a uh, parenchyma. So, uh, I guess if the future is uh, in these brain and flow oxygen monitoring, maybe a lot of surgeries will uh, won't do it. We won't be operating as much as uh, we should, and maybe the there there shouldn't be some some changes. So, I guess for me that's that's the future that we have to 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 look for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for. Uh, uh, um, uh, adding your comments in this hot topic. Thank you very much, Dr. Byron and Dr. Andreas. So do we have any other question or comment or shall we move on? So uh, we'll move on to the next topic of the session. Uh, and I would request Professor Andreas and uh, Professor Tariq and all the discussion to be with us because as the theme of the 
webinar, we always have one uh, guest, a senior speaker, and one young neurosurgeon. Today, apparently, uh, Dr. Claudia from Brazil was supposed to speak, but she just uh, mailed me that she's caught up into an emergency. She's on call, so she's not able to present. So, uh, but we have uh, another presenter, Dr. Mayank Nakipuria from India. Uh, I'll just uh, introduce shortly. Uh, Dr. Mayank Nakipuria has done his uh, neurosurgery training at Apollo Hospital Chennai. And uh, at the moment, he's doing his uh, advanced fellowship in endovascular and cerebrovascular uh, surgery at uh, Fujita Bandani Hospital, Nagoya, Japan. And Please. Uh, yes. Uh, so, okay. So, uh, uh, I think. I think Sachin's. Yes. 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 Please, Dr. Mayan. Please go ahead and share your screen. Yes. Yes. So I'll complete the introduction. So I'm currently uh, a fellow under Professor Kato at uh, uh, Nagoya in Japan, and uh, uh, actually I have not prepared it well, but uh, I'll try and present my current research, which is an interesting case of. Uh, Dural AV fistula that uh, we've managed to embolize through the upper limb uh, through a transvenous approach. So please uh, excuse my presentation, uh, but uh, it was at the last moment. So, so this case is of a uh, anterior condylar confluence uh, dural AV fistula, and uh, we did the embolization through the median cubital vein. Uh, I did a thorough literature review where I could not find any such uh, other. Uh, dural a fistula which was treated through the uh, upper limb vein so this uh, entity that is a anti anterior condylar confluence dural fistula is a very rare entity uh, 3.6 percent uh, of all dural a fistulas and uh, uh, it usually develops around the hypoglossal uh, neural tube and presents with uh, uh, different clinical symptoms so uh, previously it was very highly underreported, but uh, because of new advancements in high resolution imaging, and uh, uh, we are able to uh, diagnose it more and more. So uh, this is how uh, anterior condylar, although this entity is very well known to endovascular surgeons, uh, I think in the neurosurgery uh, community, it is not uh, very well uh, taught or uh, well um, known of. So uh, this is the anterior condylar confluence, as you can see. This is this uh, is near the hypoglossal canal, and uh, these are the different draining uh, uh, sinuses into it. May, most important of which, so this anterior condylar confluence uh, ultimately drains into the internal jugular vein, and uh, so you can see this complex network of uh, tributaries and uh, uh, of uh, this uh, uh, this place. So uh, there is anterograde drainage from the inferior petrosal sinus uh, into the uh, anti uh, condylar confluence, and also there's another vein which uh, we'll come to know uh, soon. That is a anterior uh, condylar vein. So this is another thing. Uh, so coming to my case report. Uh, So uh, this our patient was a 75 year old who presented to our clinic with a three months history of sudden onset progressive uh, bilateral vascular pulsatile tinnitus. It was uh, the tinnitus was so much that it was uh, he was unable to continue his uh, daily life uh, activities uh, and uh, on examination bruises were heard on both sides of the ear uh, bilaterally. So. Uh, Initially, a cerebral angiography was done, which showed a high flow dural AV fistula, which was anterolateral to the left hypoglossal canal. And uh, so this is the image of the uh, DSA, the cerebral angiogram. So this is a selective occipital artery injection. Uh, this is the occipital artery injection. And uh, this shows a retrograde, the, the feeling of the venous pouch uh, near this, this is in the anterior condylar confluence near the hypoglossal canal, and uh, this uh, uh, the dye is also refluxing into the contrast is also refluxing into the inferior petrosal vein, and also uh, ultimately refluxing into the IJV. So there is a dural AV fistula here, and uh, this is the lateral view of the same. Uh, sorry, 
So this is a lateral view of the same uh, of the occipital artery injection showing the uh, multiple micro arteries which are supplying this uh, neural AV fistula, the venous pouch. And ultimately it is draining into the inferior petrosal vein retrogradely and the IJV, which you can see here. So, uh, so this is from the left occipital artery uh, se uh, selective injection. And this is from the right ascending pharyngeal artery injection. So the left uh, ascending pharyngeal artery also showed uh, this similar picture, which is of uh, filling of the venous pouch and draining retrogradely into the inferior petrosal vein and into the IJV. And this is from the other side, the right side uh, and uh, ascending pharyngeal artery selective injection, which shows uh, that the dye is contrast is uh, going to the opposite side uh, and filling the venous pouch and retrogradely draining into the inferior petrosal vein and uh, anterogradely into the internal jugular vein. So this is the lateral view of the same thing, uh, showing right ascending pharyngeal injection, causing uh, uh, retrograde region to inferior petrosinus and IJV. So this is the uh, reconstruction image of the 3D rotational uh, DSA. Uh, so this shows this hypoglossal canal, and as we said, it's anterior and lateral to the uh, to the hypoglossal canal. This shows the multiple micro feeders which are arising from the occipital artery and supplying the dural AV fistula and uh, then uh, this shows the draining vein and the left IGV this is the left uh, IGV this uh, image also shows the multiple feeders so uh, so in this case uh, uh, we decided to uh, do a transvenous embolization of the dural AV fistula because it is a, a, a well-proven treatment uh, of uh, transvenous embolization because uh, these uh, arteries uh, that supply, if a trans arterial embolization is uh, attempted, often uh, while embolizing the arteries, they, these arteries supply the lower cranial nerves as well. So while doing a, a, a embolization of the arteries, sometimes the uh, lower cranial nerve palsy can, has also been reported in literature. So uh, the uh, consensus is on transvenous treatment for these uh, entities. So uh, in our case, uh, we used uh, a medial cubital vein approach. So uh, luckily for us, the patient had large uh, uh, medial cubital vein of the elbow. And this is the pre-puncture image and the post-puncture image. So we were able to embolize through the uh, upper limb veins. And uh, this is uh, the procedure on how we uh, did it. So through the medial cubital vein, uh, a catheter was put into the uh, internal jugular vein. And uh, through the femoral artery on the right side, uh, we uh, put in uh, the, we did the angiography from the right side. So this is selective anterior pharyngeal artery injection. So showing that Catheter is in the left IJV and the venous pouch as we described earlier. So this is after the coil placement. Uh, so uh, we placed a balloon catheter in the anterior condylar vein. If you can see, see this, uh, this is the balloon catheter in the anterior condylar vein. And so that while placing the coils, the coils uh, don't embolize into the anterior condylar vein and that can cause uh, uh, further problems. So uh, this is the balloon catheter and anterior condylar vein and we placed the coil and we were able to occlude it completely. As soon as we placed the last coil, the patient uh, was awake and he said that my tinnitus has uh, disappeared completely. And even on auscultating, uh, no uh, brewery could be heard. Uh, so uh, after the embolization, we did a, uh, again the uh, angiography which showed no filling uh, of the venous pouch and there was no drainage uh, into the uh, left uh, inferior petrosal vein uh, and the uh, IGV also. So this is from the left occipital artery, from the right side ascending pharyngeal artery, here you can see the coil mass here, and there's no uh, drainage into the venous sinuses. Uh, so the dural a fistula has been occluded. And um, this is also left ascending pharyngeal artery injection shows no filling of the uh, dural AV fistula. So uh, 
the reason why we wanted to publish uh, this is because uh, the uh, upper limb venous embolization is a very good modality uh, to treat these patients because uh, but it does have its uh, limitations uh, limitations include that uh, sometimes if the patient is obese it's very difficult to cannulate the uh, vein and uh, put a four french or five french uh, sheath into this uh, vein but uh, it can be a good uh, alternative when uh, this femoral vein cannot be used for example in inguinal uh, infection bilateral lower limb venous thrombosis uh, if there is a ivc filter placed before and uh, uh, dialysis catheter placements uh, central venous stenosis also uh, uh, sometimes the, while puncturing the femoral vein there is an accident inadvertent puncture of the femoral artery also so uh, that is also uh, a reason why we can uh, use the upper limb approach uh, to embolize uh, these neural AV fistulas. And uh, also there, uh, so uh, in fact, uh, in our hospital here in uh, uh, Nagoya, we also use the, usually use the distal radial approach uh, through the radial artery. We don't do a femoral uh, artery puncture. So this also improves the mobilization, but for this treatment, we used a fem uh, right femoral artery puncture for the uh, angiography. So, uh, so this is uh, what my presentation is about. And the conclusion is that um, the median elbow vein can, median cubital vein can be safely used for endovascular uh, transvenous embolization. So thank you and I would, uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayank. I uh, am very thankful to you that on 11th hour you accepted uh, to fill up the gap for the glossia and uh, made a beautiful presentation of about um, a very unusual case of anterior condylar confluent uh, levy fistula. I can see a hand raised by Dr. Oraz. Dr. Oraz is from Turkmenistan. Dr. Oras, can you please introduce yourself and uh, uh, make your comments or your doubt, Dr. Oras? Yes, Dr. Oras, are you there? Okay, he's in the discussion. I'll just, Dr. Oras, I'm making you a panelist. Just accept that. Yes. Just accept that and then you can, uh, yes, now you can speak. Just unmute yourself and you can ask your doubt. Dr. Sachin, hello. Do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Please, yeah. please introduce yourself and ask yeah. a question. Uh, hello, dear colleagues, dear professors. I'm a neurosurgeon from uh, Turkmenistan, uh, Oraz. Uh, thank you for this uh, great opportunity, Dr. Sachin and Dr. Professor uh, Kato. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, say uh, thank you for the uh, last presentation. It was very nice, uh, to, uh, understandable. Uh, and I want to ask uh, one question. If uh, uh, when you do uh, the uh, uh, venous embolization, the patient in awake or uh, you, are, you did in with uh, some anest uh, uh, general anesthesia or something? Yes. Uh, so... Uh, in uh, uh, this is in Japan uh, or in Nagoya uh, in Professor Ka under Professor Kato, usually all uh, DSAs and even most treatments are just done under monitored anesthesia care. So just a mild sedative, the patient is awake and uh, local anesthesia. Yes, the patient is usually very cooperative. So uh, they we we are able to do it under uh, monitored anesthesia care and local anesthesia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oras. May I request uh, Professor Tariq Khan, uh, who is the chairperson for today's session, and followed by Dr. Andreas, to uh, give us some comment about your experience, about uh, if you have had any such uh, unusual case, how you had managed, or some expert comments about from you. Professor Tariq Khan? No, honestly, I, I've never heard of this. So obviously, it's a very uh, interesting thing which you have done, and definitely uh, using the anti vein if possible, 
uh, obviously reduces the morbidity as well. Um, so I'm sure the patient has done well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Dr. Andreas, may I request your expert comment about uh, of your experience about dural fistula, especially the anterior condyle lift confluence, please? Thank you, Sajin, and congratulations to Dr. Nakipuria. Uh, well, I, I don't do, I'm not a vascular neurosurgeon, so therefore um, I'm sure better comments can come from vascular colleagues. However, I, I was impressed with your presentation and how methodically you, you've uh, tackled the subject. I haven't seen anything similar, so clearly this is quite uncommon. Uh, and I was interested to use and um, to be done in your setting by a neurosurgeon or a radiologist or both. So that's that's another relevant topic that uh, in Europe we are having um, some countries where a neurosurgeon can do endovascular, in others where they're not allowed. So that's something uh, we need to tackle also as a specialty. And your in your setting, who does it? So in India, uh, both neurosurgeons, neuroradiologists, as well as uh, neurologists also have started to do this uh, endovascular procedure. But I think in Japan, when I came here, I think most of the neurosurgeons are trained in endovascular, which is quite interesting, actually. Uh, so I think uh, as uh, young neurosurgeons, we should not miss out on endovascular training because uh, then only I think we will be able to uh, properly treat our patients and give them all the options they deserve. So Anders, uh, in Japan, we have a more than 10,000 neurosurgeons now, and uh, more than 5,000 is has a board satisfied of the endovascular. So most of them are hybrid neurosurgeons. So they can decide their, their indication by themselves, even at night. Thank you. That's excellent. And it's clearly a, a, a problem we need to tackle in Europe because every country has its own rules and own, regula own regulations. So we don't have a European wide policy. It's not possible. Uh, but it clearly, it's a condition that has been treated by neurosurgeons for, for decades. And if we do not uh, find a way to be involved, we will lose it. I, I think I'm glad to hear that Japan is showing the way in this. And uh, again, more lessons to be learned in, in how you manage that and how we can probably help our younger generation stay involved with, uh, with this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So yes, Dr. Ablai, uh, you have any question? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nakipuria for such an interesting presentation. Uh, uh, I'd like to know, um, I'd like to ask you, I mean, um, do you uh, use uh, for ordinary cases, uh, femoral artery root, or um, you mentioned that sometimes you use radial artery root. What uh, are indications for radial and for femoral root? Thank you. Yes, thank you, that's a nice question. So. So back in India, where I did my training and where I was practicing, so we did all uh, through the femoral artery route only. Because uh, for radial artery, you need a very small sheath and a very thin wire mm -hmm. to cannulate it. And uh, there are problems with the radial artery approach, uh, including vasospasm, which is a very well-known entity. So uh, mm -hmm. if you are able to manage these, and uh, I was quite surprised when I came here to Japan, I saw that they do almost... 100% of the cases through the radial artery approach, uh, mm -hmm. including DSAs and most treatments, actually. So uh, not only radial, I've here seen that they do a distal uh, radial approach. That is, they uh, puncture in the anatomical snuff box. So that even uh, uh, preserves the artery. So you can even do a repeat puncture through the uh, radial approach. So uh, what I think is you need a, a better sheath, which is available here in Japan. Uh, you need a specialized sheath and a specialized uh, microwire, uh, and then you can do radial. The advantage of that is that uh, the patient can be mobilized almost immediately. Like after two, three hours, you can actually uh, make the patient sit. Uh, actually, the patient gets up from the angio table himself uh, and can walk to the stretcher himself herself. And after a couple of hours, if you want, or you can even discharge in the same day. 
So uh, that is quite an um, advantage of the radial uh, artery. Obviously, yes, you have to do the Allen's test, which is uh, you have to check uh, for the integrity of the uh, ulnar artery as well as the radial artery. So if uh, obviously there is peripheral uh, arterial disease or uh, some sort of that, then you cannot do these. Uh, then, then you have to go through the femoral approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, usually in Kazakhstan, we um, neurosurgeons do um, endovascular, uh, neurosurgeons also endovascular uh, surgeries. Uh, that's why I, I asked. And uh, in most cases, maybe in, in all cases, we usually do femoral artery. I just see once uh, we used, yes, the upper limbs. Maybe we can send a video for you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ablai, for uh, participating actively. And thank you very much, Dr. Mayang, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, 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 I have one question. Uh, uh, although we have discussed this case when I was there, this case was performed and I witnessed this case. But I just want to check your, your uh, maybe understanding about this case. So in your opinion, if this patient develops uh, some tinnitus again, uh, what would be the possibilities? Why would it develop? And if it would, it would develop, then what would be your strategy to, uh, uh, to intervene? And how do you manage this case? One thing. And how do you see the uh, utility of only coils and not glue? Because we did not use any glue in this case. We used only coils. So what is your thought uh, um, um, as a student uh, about this case. Uh, thank you. That's a very nice question, actually. So uh, uh, after uh, we've done a follow-up DSA, actually, I did not disclose that. So and the follow-up DSA, we looked for new recruitment. So uh, these uh, dural a fistulas usually recruit through other vessels because the now the primary channels have closed. So uh, we should look for recruitment from the internal carotid artery or from other branches of the external carotid artery. So uh, we should look for that. And if I believe if the patient does, is doing well clinically, then we should not intervene at all. If uh, the patient still uh, develops tinnitus again, then we should look for uh, the feeders which are coming and uh, we should try to embolize that. Yes, as you said, uh, we can use glue and even the trans arterial embolization is also a, uh, proven uh, way of treatment of these things. So the latest treatment, in fact, is to use onyx. But uh, I think uh, the availability of onyx uh, is a little bit uh, difficult here. So uh, the primary, uh, usually we use a trans uh, coil, coil embolization is preferred here. But uh, onyx also is a good alternative uh, treatment uh, for embolizing these relationships. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you're doing very well and your understanding is also improving. I think Dr. Uh, Tamura Sensei is a very good teacher. It's always very uh, good to interact with him. So just convey my regards to him and all the best for your remaining fellowship. Yes, Dr. Dilshad has raised his hand. Dr. Dilshad. Hi, thank you. Uh, good evening for everybody. Uh, thank you. So for organizing this uh, webinar again, um, I have a question about uh, the uh, uh, Dr. Mayank my, uh, mentioned about uh, lower cranial nerve palsies cases in, in case of uh, uh, embolization of uh, dural arteriovenous fistulas. Uh, is it due to uh, overpacking of coils or uh, uh, or vasospasm do, uh, vasospastic uh, procedure for cranial nerve uh, uh, vasculature or other reasons? Can you uh, uh, tell about this? Uh, thank you, Dr. Dilshaw. That's a very nice question, actually. So uh, that... Uh, low cranial nerve palsy has been usually described in the trans arterial embolization. So because these are very small uh, micro arteries and it is very difficult to do a selective embolization of the micro arteries. 
so whenever uh, and trans arterial embolization is only by glue uh, so when you inject the glue in adventently you are going to in uh, embolize some very small micro arteries which supply the lower cranial nerve so that is why a transvenous route is preferred but if you have no other go then uh, you might have to uh, embolize trans arterially so that is why we prefer transvenous over trans arterial okay understand thank you Sachin, unmute, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Dilshad, uh, for uh, your comments and Dr. Mayang for wonderful case presentation. I think we'll move on. And actually, uh, in the absence of Glossy, I had made request to both Mayang and Alberto, and apparently both of them had accepted. So uh, I would request Alberto also to uh, have a short presentation. So I'll just shortly introduce Dr. Alberto. Dr. Alberto is a neurosurgeon from Italy and he's practicing at the moment at the Verona. He uh, is uh, ex-alumni uh, of Fujita Health University, Bantane Hospital. Uh, his main area of interest is uh, endoscopic uh, uh, neurosurgery and especially endoscopic endo uh, intraventricular neurosurgery. And today is going to talk about uh, uh, endoscopic aspiration of the intraventricular hematoma. So I'd request Professor Alberto to start his screen and uh, make a short presentation. Dr. Alberto, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sachin. Uh, yes, as uh, Dr. Nakipuria, I also have been asked to prepare this very last minute presentation. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Sachin and Professor Kato for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk actually in a... Uh, in a young neurosurgeon uh, uh, session, which makes me particularly happy because it means you consider me still a young neurosurgeon. Uh, so uh, I ask you to forgive me if uh, the headings uh, of the, my first uh, slide uh, uh, don't match uh, with, uh, uh, with this event because I had to uh, uh, use uh, this presentation I gave uh, actually uh, last month in January during uh, this event held in uh, Napoli, Italy. It was an uh, endoscopic uh, meeting with hands-on also. It's an international uh, meeting promoted by the Italian Society of Neurosurgery, but also the International Federation of uh, Neuroendoscopy. And actually, this is a good uh, chance for me to invite uh, you all uh, especially the young neurosurgeons, to uh, uh, attend the next uh, event uh, next year uh, in Napoli. So uh, the topic uh, I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, endoscopy in interventricular hemorrhage. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes. No thank you. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, as you uh, all know, uh, interventricular hemorrhage uh, uh, carries a very high mortality rate, up to 80% in some uh, series. It's a very, it has a very, very bad prognosis. Uh, we know that uh, interventricular hemorrhage is an independent prognostic factor of poor outcome. We also know from the literature that uh, in case of uh, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, the presence of blood in the ventricles increases the risk of death. And we also know that in patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage, more than 20 milliliters uh, of interventricular blood uh, can be uh, lethal. Uh, this happens because of many reasons, not only because of uh, a raised intracranial hypertension and hydrocephalus, but also because there is a chemical damage uh, with an inflammatory response due to the blood, and there is also a mass effect and uh, consequent reduced cerebral blood flow. So for all these reasons, we need to reduce the mass effect due to blood as soon as possible. Uh, in general, uh, the most common uh, treatment, uh, we all know it is, uh, uh, is uh, external ventricular drainage, which is, uh, of course, a very simple procedure and it allows a fast resolution of acute hydrocephalus. But it also has some cons, uh, like uh, uh, it often needs to be bilateral because there are frequent obstructions of the catheter 
Uh, so we have to uh, replace the, the EVD very frequently sometimes. And uh, we have to wait a long time before actually we can see the blood washed out from the ventricles. So, though, so this has the consequence of a longer hospital stay and an increase of complications. Uh, think about uh, infections, for example. We know that uh, we can use uh, fibrinolytic therapy uh, in uh, uh, these patients uh, with an EVD, but uh, literature and uh, uh, many studies show that uh, this um, therapy uh, does not substantially improve functional outcomes uh, in our patients. And from the literature and also from common experience, uh, we also know that uh, uh, in hemorrhagic fourth ventricular dilation is the most significant outcome predictor in uh, patients uh, with uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. So blood in the fourth ventricle is the most significant factor in influencing prognosis. Uh, the only way we have nowadays to get rid of blood from the ventricles, even from the fourth ventricle, uh, is uh, endoscopic treatment. As you can see from these images, uh, on the left side, we have the preoperative uh, CT scan. On the right side, the early postoperative CT scan. And you can see that we can remove blood even from the third and the fourth ventricles. Uh, our group already published uh, some papers about, about this technique. And uh, we show that it is possible using this technique to not only reduce the Gribe score, uh, uh, of these uh, patients, but also we can uh, uh, limit mortality and uh, have a, a quite good uh, outcome in these patients. Uh, and also we can reduce, potentially we can reduce uh, the uh, VP shunt dependency uh, in our patients. Uh, uh, this uh, graph shows uh, uh, a group of patients treated uh, by endoscopy. And this uh, graph uh, shows a group B of patients treated by EVD alone. And it is uh, quite clear that uh, the number of patients requiring a VP shunt after the operation with the uh, black bars is significantly higher in the patient treated by EVD alone compared by endoscopy. And this uh, benefits uh, have been uh, confirmed also by other groups and uh, also by this uh, uh, meta-analysis, which was published uh, in 2019. How can we uh, obtain these results? We need a flexible endoscope to get to the fourth ventricle, of course. Uh, we use uh, the operative channel of the flexible endoscope like a sucker uh, we uh, use very simple devices like a uh, pill away to cannulate the ventricle and uh, a syringe to uh, aspirate blood and a uh, pipeline uh, with water, of course. Uh, the access point is uh, uh, really crucial in this, uh, uh, in this uh, operation. The entry point must not be too lateral. Usually, we place the bar hole 1.5 centimeters from the midline. Uh, this helps in uh, uh, cannulating the cerebral aqueduct uh, with an, uh, in an easy way. If it is too lateral, the cannulation of the cerebral aqueduct might be very challenging. And the maneuvers we use are just two maneuvers. Irrigation uh, to unveil anatomical landmarks uh, and aspiration to, of course, remove the blood clots. Uh, this uh, video shows uh, what you usually can see in these operations. I initially, uh, this operation can be very uh, frustrating. Uh, I always say, th say that because uh, what you can see is uh, basically uh, only red, uh, the red of blood in the ventricle. You don't have to be discouraged you have to aspirate and irrigate, and suddenly you see the first landmarks will appear. The first is usually the appendix, the white ependyma. So when the white ependyma appears on the screen, you have to stop doing aspiration and do irrigation instead. And then you move on 
uh, sorry, you move on with further aspirations and irrigations until you see the choroid plexus and the Monroe foramen. Uh, here we are, oh, sorry, maybe I missed the first video. Okay. So you do aspiration and irrigation. You see the choroid plexus, which is a very important landmark. And you have to follow this landmark all the way to the back of the ventricle, but most importantly, uh, forwards uh, towards the Monroe foramen, which appears here. Of course, it is also obstructed by clots. You have to do the same maneuvers, irrigation and aspiration. And after removing the blood clots from the Monroe foramen and the anterior third ventricle, the structures of the anterior third ventricle will appear. Now you will see the mammillary bodies here. Of course, the vision is impaired by the blood also. This is the tuber scenarium, and this is the infundibulum with the optic chiasm up here. And lamina terminalis is also seen. And then you direct the tip of the scope all the way to the back part of the third ventricle. And you do the same maneuvers, aspiration and irrigation. And finally, you will un uh, unveil the ependyma and the additum of the cerebral aqueduct, which is, of course, also obstructed by uh, blood clots. But you can remove these blood clots and have a very nice vision uh, of the additum of the cerebral aqueduct with the posterior commissure, the habenular commissure. This is the pineal recess. And I will move on here. You can see completely cleaned posterior third ventricle. And then you enter. You can enter the uh, cerebral aqueduct and remove the clots also from the cerebral aqueduct and from the fourth ventricle. And you can finally see the floor of the fourth ventricle with the canalis centralis medullaris and the calamus scriptorius. And then if you remove more clots, you can uh, unveil the, the picas. This is the left pica. This is the choroid plexus in the Lushka foramen. And here the Monroe, uh, the Magendie foramen. And the right side, Lushka foramen. And if you uh, move on, of course, you can see uh, the cisterna magna, which is completely cleared. Uh, and the tonsilla uh, of the cerebellum. Now I am withdrawing the endoscope. You can see the pica and again the canalis centralis medullaris with the floor and the roof of the fourth ventricle with the final inspection see, uh, revealing a normal anatomy uh, of the fourth ventricle. Uh, you can uh, use this technique also after uh, securing uh, cerebral and rupture cerebral aneurysm. Sometimes uh, interventricular hemorrhage uh, comes with, uh, uh, and it is due to a ruptured aneurysm. Uh, in uh, some cases, we did coiling and then neuroendoscopy immediately after coiling. Look at this case uh, of uh, um, periconosal artery uh, ruptured aneurysm, which was coiled. And then after coiling, we immediately operated the patient with the flexible endoscope and we could remove the blood completely from the ventricles. Uh, this is another case of basilar artery uh, aneurysm, ruptured aneurysm, which was coiled and the patient was immediately operated. And you can uh, immediately see uh, the decompression of the posterior fossa compared to the preoperative CT scan. This is the immediate postoperative CT scan. Similarly, you can uh, do neuroendoscopy also after clipping of a ruptured aneurysm. Uh, in this case, I clipped this uh, MCA aneurysm. Uh, this is the immediate CT scan with, of course, uh, still intraventricular hemorrhage. And so I immediately uh, went back to the OR with a flexible scope. I removed the blood clots from uh, the ventricles. Thank you very much, and I'm uh, happy to receive uh, eventual questions. 
thank you thank you very much dr alberto for wonderful and a very crisp and short presentation about endoscopic aspiration of the intraventricular uh, hemorrhage uh, uh, apparently dr professor tarik khan had to leave for an another meeting so he has left so but i would request uh, if dr professor andreas is there maybe professor andreas uh, can you make some comments about uh, uh, dr alberto's presentation and some uh, uh, light on uh, how to manage the intraventricular hemorrhage thank you sachin but well done alberto i think it was a very well presented uh, uh, presentation and it had uh, an easy to follow structure, uh, very clear, and actually I learned quite a lot from it. So thank you again for putting it together. Um, I mean, endoscopic usage is becoming very popular. And uh, I think you put a good case for supporting that use. Uh, you know, some endoscopes are more advanced than others, and some endoscopists like yourself are, are more comfortable in using the flexible than others who prefer the, the rigid. But on the whole, this is a technology that's been around in neurosurgery for quite a few decades. And therefore, we need to continue using it and, and training uh, those of us who have special interest for it. I mean, as you know, it has now got a place in in cranial neurosurgery, in endonasal endoscopic skull-based surgery, uh, spine, and so on. So I think on the whole, this is a yet another sign that the technology and neurosurgery are well aligned. So thank you, Alberto, for, for pushing those boundaries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so... Are there any uh, doubts or any questions? Yes, Dr. Byron, uh, if you have a hand raised, please you. make a comment, Dr. Byron. Thank you, Sachin. And first of all, congratulate Dr. Faleri for an excellent lecture. Actually, a very a nice procedure. A, I guess for for you, like you have this, this a lot of a practice, a experience, maybe it could be easy to, to navigate with this flexible endoscope and with this kind of imaging that at least for, uh, for many people would be difficult actually to go and navigate inside the, the ventricles, going to the third and, and to the fourth and so on, and not have these um, perfect 3D image, let's see. And to navigate with this condition, you know, you have to, to have a lot of experience. So I guess that would be an, an expert uh, technique that we should all uh, be working a lot to gain a lot of experience, not, not to harm the patient. Uh, on the other side, uh, well, I, I actually haven't done this procedure. We manage, uh, uh, we, we take in, into reference the, the journal that, uh, that compared one versus two EVDs that was published in the Journal of Neurosurgery in 2018. And we know that at the fifth day, you know, using two EVDs, the volume of the intraventricular hemorrhage, hemorrhage will uh, will diminish significantly against one DVD. And of course, we know the risk of the uh, subdural hematoma, double the risk of infection. So actually my practice, uh, I rarely use two DVDs, two EVDs, actually we used one. And the other thing that I saw in your images after the procedure, do you leave an EVD also? So uh, <clears throat> that, that uh, maybe I have a, a little of question because if you are going to have an EVD, maybe, uh, you know, what would be the, the, the main indication for, you know, for using the your endoscopic uh, procedure? So I don't know if you have any uh, risk of infection or any kind of complications after you have all clean almost the oh, 90%, 95% of what I see the, of, of the intraventricular hemorrhage. A white to live on EVD. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, comments and uh, for the question. Actually, uh, for the sake of time, I didn't uh, uh, tell uh, you everything, uh, but this question actually gives me the opportunity to uh, specify the technique. I always leave an EVD at the end of the procedure because it's a safety device. Uh, usually patients uh, are impaired from a 
neurological point of view. So I want to have control of intracranial pressure, but I get rid of the EVD as soon as possible. I mean, after clearing all the blood from the ventricles, um, I leave the EVD and uh, usually I leave it open, but very high, like 15, 20 centimeters from the tragus. So I want uh, in this way, monitor uh, intracranial pressure. And then uh, based on uh, uh, the neurological status of the patient, I close uh, this EVD. And usually I'm able to remove the EVD uh, in the second or third day, post-operative day. Uh, so this uh, decreases dramatically uh, the length of stay of the EVD. Uh, and uh, I think this is a, a beneficial for, for, for the patients uh, uh, because it reduces the uh, risk of infections. Uh, the fact that you said it is possible actually to place two EVDs and this speeds up the process uh, of blood uh, uh, removal or uh, lysation, it's true actually, but there are two problems. The first one is that you have to uh, place two bar holes with two uh, trajectories in the brain. So this is more invasive than just one bar hole. The second problem is that you have to leave these EVDs for days, and this increases the risk of infections. And the third problem is uh, comes from a very interesting paper published by a Japanese uh, neurosurgeon, actually, a few years ago, uh, showing that when we uh, place the EVD in these patients and then we uh, perform a CT scan a few days later, uh, we see in most of cases that the blood is apparently uh, gone after seven to 10 days. But this paper uh, showed that it is not true. The blood changed uh, its density on CT scan, but the CSF is still dirty. It's, there is still blood inside. So this can increase the impairment of reabsorption of CSF. And this can... Uh, potentially increase uh, uh, the inflammation uh, of the brain, uh, leading to a further uh, impairment of the clinical condition of the patient. So in general, I think uh, if we have the, 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 the possibility to remove very soon the blood from uh, the brain of a patient, it's better to remove. Um, uh, the fact that uh, it is necess necessary to uh, be trained, well-trained, is crucial. You mentioned that. I agree with you. This is not the first procedure that a young neurosurgeon should perform using a flexible scope. This is at the very end of the learning curve. First, a uh, young neurosurgeon should learn how to navigate the lateral ventricle, how to perform an EVD with a flexible scope. This operation removal of intraventricular blood is at the end of the learning curve. But I have to tell you, I use both rigid and flexible scopes, but I feel mo much, much more safe and comfortable if I use a flexible scope in the ventricles because uh, the fact that it is flexible, uh, you know, I know that it uh, nicely adapts to the complex geometry of the ventricular system without uh, uh, giving any damage. Uh, in my experience, it is very difficult to damage uh, brain structures with a flexible scope. But I agree with you. Uh, training is required. Thank you, Professor. Just a follow up a question uh, really quickly. Uh, we are used to, to measuring the, uh, in the MRI when we are going to do a TVA, uh, you know, the diameter of the foramen of Monroe, maybe the aqueduct. And uh, of course, in this uh, situation that it's, well, uh, an emergency, I don't know if you do any MRI, any kind of measure of the structure so you can actually, you know, be safe that, you know, it's not going to, to damage some structure while passing the, the endoscope. Right. So I uh, do MRI if it is not an emergent situation. In these patients uh, with intraventricular hemorrhage, I don't do uh, MRI. I do MRIs 
in uh, elective cases uh, like uh, uh, ETVs for uh, obstructive hydrocephalus, or uh, sometimes I do perforation of membranes in the cerebral aqueduct. I want to see where the basilar artery is and, you know, uh, so on. But in emergency cases in general, it is not necessary because uh, you can go through uh, even a very small Monroe foramen with a flexible scope. Uh, and you have not to, uh, you know, be worried about the entry point because being flexible, it's not like a rigid scope. You have to, you know, calculate the trajectory uh, of the scope uh, based on the position of the Monroe foramen and maybe the cerebral aqueduct if you want to go all the way to the back of the third ventricle. With a flexible scope, uh, the bar hole is placed always at the same point and you can get wherever you want because of the fact that it is flexible, actually. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Byron. Your comments are always very useful. And you are, uh, although you're president of Hungarian uh, Neurosurgical Society, but you are an exemplary neurosurgeon. I've always followed your presentation. I remember that presentation which you make uh, as a step-by-step -step how to handle the instrument and everything is very, very good. So your comments are always, always very important. Please, uh, we request you to uh, uh, participate in our webinar and uh, make comments and participate. Thank you very much. So, so Dr. Alberto, we have many questions for you and we'll start one by one in the order they had raised the hand. First of all, uh, Dr. Ablay from Kazakhstan. Yes, Dr. Ablay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pivati, for such an interesting... I think... Uh... Uh, presentation like actually, I have a few questions. Um, first, of all, what, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Uh, now yes, we can hear you. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Um, how do you think what is the uh, cause of a uh, higher percentage of um, shunt dependence during the EVD than during the endoscopic? Um, endoscopic procedure, and um, also if uh, uh, there is the, uh, such a um, risk. Um, does it make sense uh, or is there any reason to do preventive third uh, ventricular stomach? Um, and uh, also, uh, what are the contraindications for uh, endoscopic uh, procedure? Do you have any? And um, what is the most, what are the most frequent complications? during the endoscopic procedure thank you oh thank you very much uh, you made you asked me a lot of questions uh, and actually very interesting questions so uh, the first one is about uh, the reason why uh, the the group of patients uh, uh, we treated uh, by evd uh, has a higher percentage risk uh, of hydrocephalus, of the patient dependency compared to the patients treated by endoscopy, right? So yeah. uh, the most probable reason is that uh, if, you, uh, if you remove blood uh, very soon from uh, the ventricles of the patients, uh, these patients uh, uh, are more likely to uh, develop an impairment of, uh, you know, CSF reabsorption. Yeah. Uh, so uh, probably this is the main reason, at least uh, reading the literature, uh, this should be the most probable reason. Uh, you asked also about uh, the possibility to perform an ETV uh, to further reduce the risk of VP shunt dependency. Uh, it's actually a good question, and it's something I also thought uh, to do in these patients. Uh, I admit I have never performed an, a preventive ETV. Um, you know, ETV uh, is something that is considered uh, among the, the basic neurosurgical uh, procedures, but still it has some, uh, um, you know, complica potential complications. Uh, and especially in patients uh, with intraventricular hemorrhage, uh, the vision is not very clear, as you as you could see uh, from my videos. 
because uh, blood is, uh, you know, confounding the vision and impairing your vision. So um, we have to be very careful to perform uh, a procedure which is not strictly required, which is actually uh, preventive, as you said, uh, and which can lead to potential complications that can be dramatic because if you if you injure uh, the basilar artery and as i told you you don't have often the possibility to perform an mri in these emergent cases so you don't know exactly where the basilar artery is i i would not recommend to do an etv in such conditions unless the intraoperative view is very very clear in those cases we might consider but you know you need a trial a clinical trial uh, with all the requirements to perform uh, uh, such a procedure in these cases you also asked about contraindications uh, for this technique there are contraindications uh, we we wrote about these contraindications in, uh, in a couple of books about this technique we published uh, for example if you have an unsecured uh, brain aneurysm or avm you uh, you cannot perform uh, this kind of procedure because you increase the risk of uh, re-bleeding. Uh, another contraindication is patient uh, uh, under treat under uh, you know um, anticoagulants uh, treatment. Uh, this uh, is usually a contraindication. And you also asked about complications. Uh, of course, uh, infections. Uh, is a contra is a potential complication um, and uh, injury to uh, brain structures like uh, the fornix can be a potential complication never happened uh, to me in my series i have no memories uh, but it is possible to uh, have small damages to the ependema of the aqueduct of the cerebral aqueduct uh, this is possible. I have some uh, patients with small, uh, little contusions on the wall of the cerebral aqueduct, but uh, without any consequence from a clinical point of view. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your questions. Yes, I, uh, I just you, forgot uh, to mention this the, uh, regarding the second question about uh, third ventricular stomach, that if there is clear, everything is clear, your uh, operating um, field is clear. Maybe after that, yes, thank you. But yeah. yes, I understood everything. Thank you. But, you know, I prefer to uh, postpone, eventually postpone an e, uh, ETV uh, procedure uh, at the second stage, like a second yeah. operation in these patients. I got eventually. it. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, so, uh, next question, uh, Dr. Mayank, I can see your hand raised. Do you want to ask any questions? So just one small uh, question. I really thank you for the presentation and your tips for young neurosurgeons on that we should do uh, not go for aspiration directly and rather do an EVD first. I think that is, uh, I will uh, incorporate that. Uh, thank you, Professor. But but my question is, uh, uh, like the stitch, what we read in theory, that the stitch trial and uh, other trials uh, say that medical management is comparable to surgical. So I just want to know, uh, Professor, what is your indications for uh, doing this procedure? And uh, do you consider or uh, have you tried uh, uh, RTPA uh, installation also? Uh, just that. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Uh, so... Um, all the trials, the published trials, uh, compared uh, uh, surg surgery uh, and medical treatment, but uh, by surgery, they uh, um, thought about uh, either uh, open craniotomy uh, or uh, endoscopy, but uh, in uh, uh, in intracerebral hemorrhage, not intraventricular hemorrhage. Uh, I, I don't think there is any published trial uh, comparing medical treatment with uh, endoscopic treatment in the ventricles using a flexible scope. There, is, there are no, there are not. So this should be done, I think. 
but we need more centers performing this kind of surgery to be able to perform such a trial. Um, you, your your other question was about uh, RTP. Uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we don't use. We don't use because uh, um, as long as you are able to remove completely uh, the blood from the ventricles, there is uh, really no need to to inject anything in the ventricles. You just uh, increase the risks for the patients. So we don't use it anymore. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayank. I can see one more hand raised by Dr. Yusra from Pakistan. Dr. Yusra, please go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for such a nice presentation. It was a very um, thorough one. I would just like to ask that um, what's the indication in your cases um, for removing EVD? Is it the ICP or um, is it the scans that you rely on? Yes, thank you for your question. Uh, the indication is uh, the same as the indication to place an EVD. So if you admit a patient with a intraventricular hemorrhage, sometimes uh, you uh, just manage the patient medically because there is no hydrocephalus. So there is no need to place even an EVD. In those patients, uh, I don't do uh, endoscopy. But there are some patients requiring an EVD uh, because they are uh, in a comatose state, because uh, they have hydrocephalus due to the blood in the ventricles. So in all cases, uh, I uh, decide to place an EVD or I would place an EVD. Before placing an EVD, I do uh, endoscopic removal of blood. And then I leave an EVD and try to remove the EVD, as I told you before, in two or three days. So the indications are the same as usually done by EVD. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Yusra. Uh, I think we'll take one last question because we have another meeting after this and we need to close down this uh, webinar. So I request Dr. Heba. Please go ahead and ask your doubt. Dr. Heba, are you there? Uh, hello, yes, I'm there. Thanks, Professor Alberto, for this uh, quite uh, interesting presentation. I have a question. It might sound a little bit controversial, but I just wanted to know uh, your idea about the ventricular subgallium. Um, that sometimes people put uh, the, the, the proximal ends and uh, make a pocket uh, in the subgallial space. And the other thing is the irrigation, continuous irrigation, even in the word, uh, it's, I've seen it done before and I want to know your opinion about it by inserting uh, two tubes, one for uh, continuous irrigation by lactate and another as an output with a lower level for the irrigation. So I just wanted to know um, your opinion about it. I know it's a bit controversial and there's no many papers about it. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Heba, for the questions. So about the subgallial uh, catheter, we use this system, but only uh, with um, pa pediatric patients uh, um, with hydrocephalus. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, when they are too small to be treated with a BP shunt. So it's uh, like a, a temporary uh, treatment for pediatric patients. But we don't use this uh, subgallial catheter in cases of intraventricular uh, hemorrhage. Uh, as I said, uh, we prefer to remove the blood from the ventricles immediately. That's the definitive treatment in these patients. And about uh, irrigation, I, I know there are some uh, papers uh, talking about uh, the irrigation, so not the removal, the active aspiration of the blood clots from the ventricles, but just irrigation. I think it's uh, uh, better, of course, than EVD alone, in my opinion, because you can speed up the process of uh, uh, removal of blood. But I uh, again, of course, we don't have... Uh, 
uh, trials comparing different techniques. But uh, I think that the common sense uh, tells you that just irrigation uh, is uh, less be beneficial to the patient than uh, active removal because, because for at least two reasons. The first reason is with irrigation, uh, you have to wait days doing irrigation to obtain the result. Uh, second, uh, you have to trust the irrigation to remove the blood from the fourth ventricle because it's not possible to reach the fourth ventricle with a rigid scope. Fourth, you increase the risk for infections. Uh, compared to uh, the technique I showed you, uh, I think uh, uh, you, you, you could be able to remove immediately all the blood from the ventricles uh, uh, and reducing also uh, the infection rates. But of course, it depends on uh, which kind of equipment you have you have at your institution. Most places don't have a flexible scope. So in, in, in these cases, of course, it's better to do irrigation using a rigid scope, for example, or placing a cat two catheters compared to uh, just EVD. Uh, but if you have the chance to get a flexible scope, I encourage you to, to be trained with flexible scope and to use it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And I saw also Sachin a question on the chat, uh, what kind of solution uh, I use? I use uh, uh, Ringer lactate. Yes. So thank you. Thank you very much for very active uh, discussion uh, by all the presenters and by many young neurosurgeons today. Uh, since we're running short on time, I would uh, thank all the presenters and I request Professor Yoko Kanto to uh, say a few closing remarks before we close the session. Your microphone is off, Professor Katz. Thank you very much for all three speakers. Uh, it was an excellent talk. And I think it's a time for the less invasive, not only for the patient, but also the doctors. So we, it's, it's, it's a time for work-life balance for the doctors. It's very, very important things. And also, uh, in that means, is the endovascular treatment and also the endoscopic treatment. Both, uh, it needs some techniques. Uh, which is Albert that he mentioned, I think, but the, we must uh, learn and master uh, how we can treat uh, that uh, kind of a, a treatment. I think uh, in that means, uh, I think it, uh, it was great pictures. Thank you very much. Thank you. Byron, thank you very much. All the best for your uh, the upcoming Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And, and Andres, of course, you are the uh, uh, Spanish Summer Congress uh, in September. My best wishes. Hey. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So before we close, I have one small announcement to make. Uh, Are you able to see, see my screen? I'm not yet. No. Not yet, Sachin. No. Okay. Uh... So I'm trying to do it from my computer. So, uh... okay, just one minute. Just one minute. So are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So somebody is speaking something. Can somebody mute no, him? I, yeah. I mute that. No, I mute him. Yeah. Yeah. So just a few announcements. I said that uh, 
this acns virus webinar we conduct on every second and fourth sunday so today was the fourth sunday so next webinar will be on the second sunday of the next month that will be on the 12th of march and we'll come back with another interesting uh, topic uh, uh, next thing is on 3rd 4th and 5th of march uh, we have first acns bangladesh hybrid conference and workshop and this will be hybrid that you will be able to watch it on screen because it'll be both in person and uh, virtual uh, on 2nd march we have workshop by professor abidasha white fiber dissection workshop and uh, skull based uh, cadaver dissection workshop by professor ayub cherian and after that we'll be having live uh, endovascular workshop uh, live bypass surgery and live uh, carotid endarterectomy and along with that there are wonderful set of uh, uh, different presentation by eminent uh, guest faculty so i would request all of you to um, go through the uh, website and uh, the uh, the detailed program and please join us and uh, uh, this will be another uh, education activity uh the next thing is uh, on 29 july to 1st august we'll be having our second world congress of young neurosurgeon and this will be full of for the for four days we'll be having a uh, different workshop there are eight workshops planned and uh, uh various uh, uh just a small promotion video of the same thing so this is going to be a big learning fest for all the young neurosurgeon because full of uh, different workshop uh, many interesting uh, lectures and there'll be award session for the young neurosurgeons and women in neurosurgery so all the young neurosurgeon please uh, register and count on this uh, uh, conference and please do send your abstract for the uh, for the congress uh the next thing is about uh for the young neurosurgeon from the central asia on 15th to 17th september 2023 will be having a dedicated acns central asia silk road hybrid summer seminar so it will include uh three workshops uh the endovascular microsurgical and endoscopic along with that we'll be having uh various didactic lectures and uh a special session for the young neurosurgeon and women in neurosurgery so that's what the announcement i wanted to make uh, thank you very much uh can somebody help me to stop sharing my screen because i'm not able to do that yeah thank you very much so that's all about today and uh, we'll conclude our today's webinar thank you very much uh, Thank you so much. Thank you, Sachin. Thank you, Professor Thank Kato. You. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll be having a small meeting along with the. Uh, the organizers from central asia and uh, the organizers from bangladesh so i would request all the organizers uh, to please stay back and uh, we'll have a small meeting and then we'll close all the young neurosurgeon can uh, log out now sachin is there a younger Hi, surgeon Dr. Arian, than... how are you is there any younger surgeon than the one next to you <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> no no but you are the most important young neurosurgeon i would request you to yes. please stay back and uh, please help no, us yeah, uh, plan yeah, our next i'm enjoying it he yeah. went he yes. went the he went your daughter i think what's on you we can start please yeah uh, thanks thanks uh, professor uh today we we have a uh, uh, discussion regarding our upcoming uh, event i've invited uh, professor shafiq uh who will present on the snsd sns conference uh, upcoming uh, next next month and also professor yang is here uh, to inform us the update regarding uh, third sns interim uh, meeting in tianjin and if prof asra able to join us we also would like to hear on the progress of second a uh, worldwide ns congress and uh, eventually uh, is a uh, update from uh, prof d shot uh, on on the venue and the program uh, we we arrange for the hybrid conference uh, of central asia uh, uh, conference and that is the main thing you would like to discuss so i would like to before we start uh, 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 from the presentation from each uh, organizing chair Uh, I would like to uh, invite Professor Kato to give a welcome address, Professor. Yes, thank you very much. So we are very much expecting so many meetings. <laughs> so the first uh, the uh, president will be Dr. Ian or the new uh, will be the first. Pro Professor Shafiq. Yeah. Shafiq. Yes. Professor Shafiq. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Kato, for giving us the night opportunity to organize a hybrid conference first time in Bangladesh. Ah, uh, let me share my screen. Is my screen visible? Not yet. Yeah. So, I sent my. Uh, program detail in pdf format to your whatsapp can you open this from your computer yes yes prof i got it just one minute uh, yeah just downloading it just a moment yeah So shit. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Yokokato and uh, organizers of SCNS for giving us a nice opportunity to uh, host first SCNS PSNS hybrid conference and workshop in Bangladesh. Basically, it's hybrid in terms of uh, conference, hybrid both physical and virtual, and also hybrid in terms of uh, microvascular and endovascular. So this is our thing in the uh, in this era, the third world like a country like Bangladesh, uh, we need to be expert in microvascular as well as endovascular techniques. I mean, we need to solve this uh, uh, complex vascular issues from the neurosurgeons end. We want to train our young neurosurgeons like this. So this is our concept. Uh, So we have a four days compact program. Second of part is the conference uh, workshop. 
that will be uh, led by dr avidasha who is online with us she will be uh, conducting a session of white fever detection we have 12 attendees for that session and we have a 360 degree skull based workshop that will be conducted by uh, professor ip cherian and his team uh, total five and probably six cadaver has been arranged so that will be a very um, big fest uh, on uh, skull base and what the decision on 2nd of march as the conference workshop on 3rd march the first day we will have two live surgeries from national institute of neuroscience can you move on something yes uh our uh, national institute of neuroscience uh, probably we will be having one bypass and on any surgeries surgery bypass surgery will be done by uh, dr taki jawa and any reason will be done by dr tambola and from lungs onward we will be having two sessions on skull base glioma our team is to discuss on the topics that we had a uh, workshop on the day before and we will be having a session of on any reason as well and day two that will be conducted uh, on hotel intercontinental the day long event first event is uh, will be conducted by Toronto University group completed June session and that is uh, organized by Dr. Ashish. And this session is for two hours. That is followed by endovascular session. And endovascular session will be uh, led by Dr. Kuwayama and his team. There are five or six uh, detective lecture on that. And afternoon they will have to stick uh, three to six and that is a 3 hours ivr training workshop for the young neurosurgeon and parallelly we will have session on bypass and any reason that's all about the 2 on uh, 4th of march and we will have the uh, conference dinner afterwards and day 3 that is sunday march 5th the final day of our conference we will start with yns session that will be start at 8 in the morning for two and a half hours and that will be followed by uh, STNS nurses talk for three hours. Parallelly, we'll be having uh, live interventions and surgeries. We selected this time, uh, this surgery is on carotid endoperectomy only because we feel carotid endoperectomy surgery is very much demanding in Bangladesh along with carotid stent. and dr takija will be uh, takija will be doing this therapy tender surgery surgery and professor kuyama kuyama and his team will be doing two cases one case in flow diverter and another case is probably dural fistula we have just selected the case we'll be sharing with all the documents with professor kuyama and that's all about our conference i think uh, we uh, uh, are waiting for an excited session in first sns and bsns conference and our inaugural session will be conducted on uh, march 4 that is second day of our conference at 10:30 am for uh, it is a very brief for 15 or 20 minutes or so professor yoko kato will uh, give a welcome address in that session followed by talk from our society president and organizing chair and that's all over from my side thank you thank you thank you very much dr ben can you help me stop the sharing screen yes sure thank you thank you sir shafi it, it, it is really excellent thank you so much shop hands on and also the program Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, Ashish, you want to say something about uh, your uh, seminar? Thank you, Professor Kato. Uh, I uh, actually looked at the program. Uh, I just wanted to know because this will be a, a virtual event. Uh, how we are planning to uh, link the uh, like for the online speakers? How we are planning to send the links? because uh, i don't think i have... think by tomorrow we will send all the links of uh, uh, zoom link of online conference 
have, we have just done everything. We'll share with you everything tomorrow. And I Maybe think the other. Yeah, I mean, I, the other question was, Dr. Professor Shafiq, Shafiq was, uh, uh, when this becomes an online uh, uh, symposium in a, in a, in a, actually in a hall, right? This will be like a com combined uh, session, which will be online as well as in person there. Yeah. In the, it, it, we have uh, two ballroom. In one ballroom, we will be having this room session. We will be having audience there. And for the moderation, we'll have three. Uh, experts there. They'll conduct the session. From okay, so there will, be, there will be another one uh, uh, person live who will be coordinating with uh, the online. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's what we are planning. If you if you agree with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. If I can get the uh, details of who will be the online, uh, who will be the actual in-person moderator, it will be great to coordinate. We will do everything tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Otherwise, the program looks fantastic. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if there's no any more question, if if there's no question, we move on to the second uh, presenter, Professor Yang, uh, on the integrity professor. Hi, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Liu. Thank you very much, Professor Kato. Good evening, good professor. And uh, good evening to all other professors. Uh, I'm very honored to have this chance to report Tianjin meeting and uh, what we have done recently. And let me share the screen first. Okay. Uh, after we... Uh, only we, we uh, get the uh, opportunity to uh, have the chance uh, to hold the uh, in, in, in trim meeting of ACNS in, in the end of, of April this year. Uh, we have done some work, uh, some, some jobs uh, in past uh, couple of months. And we have sent uh, uh, we send emails to some speakers and we get response from them. Uh, this is the, some response the, uh, from a very famous the, uh, neurosurgeons around the world. Some of them will uh, would like to come to Tianjin and uh, in person, and some of them will go on the line. They would would, would like to get some. Uh, uh, given uh, lectures where the uh, virtual meeting. So like a professor, if he would like some, some uh, offline teaching course also at, at the same time. And most uh, uh, about the half professors will come from Japan. So this, this I think the most of the uh, speakers would like to come, uh, take, come to Tianjin to take part in the meeting in person. So this is the email we, we have get. So in summary, this this those those uh, professors are from all uh, uh, from abroad in uh, outside China, and I think if we hold, when we hold the meeting, we can invite many other Chinese neurosurgeons and professors uh, from Beijing, Shanghai, and some big cities of all around China. And we also have a nursing section. And uh, we have the, the chairman and the, we have a local uh, organizer of these nursing uh, sections. This is the offline speakers we summarized in, in, in the line. And those are offline possible and the, who will be uh, on the virtual uh, conference. And uh, for the comments for the speakers and all the uh, participants would like to attend to come to Tianjin 
we set up a vapor seat. This vapor seat is under construction, and we have we need more information put on the vapor seat. So when we uh, when we have constructed it, all over the world, uh, the neurosurgeons and all the uh, in, who interested in this, this course would find the useful information in the in this vapor seat. So this is the sub, sub team volunteer teams. Most of, most of them are the uh, young university post postgraduate students. Uh, right now, because the in most uh, part of the world, uh, both a lot of countries have canceled the uh, policy of the COVID nineteen. But uh, recently in China, there's still a requirement for the uh, COVID-19 test before people travel, uh, travel landing uh, in China. So right now, uh, there still COVID-19 uh, PCR test is required for uh, within 48 hours before boarding the flight to China. So, but uh, I think when, when the time goes by, the condition will improve because right now in China, we can travel to any city, any province, anywhere by flight, by, flight, by train or by car. And we, in the China, we are free. There is no requirement of COVID-19. I think at the, at the time, uh, maybe one month or two months later, the requirement will be, will be canceled. And still we have some, uh, some apps required when, when people travel to China, but it's, it's, it's easy, not, not a very complicated. So considering that if uh, speakers from all, all over the world, uh, travel to China, uh, they, they, the flights may be limited. Uh, if, if they travel to Tianjin, there may be no direct or connect flights. So we can offer a, uh, of a airport pickup service for every speakers or uh, attendees. And we can pick up them at any uh, landing, landing city such as Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and uh, anywhere. And uh, we can transfer, uh, give the service of transfer from the landing city to Tianjin. And uh, also we offer this service uh, of, from both of, uh, of stay off from Tianjin to any uh, depart, uh, depart cities. So uh, some can, in other we we checked for the condition of COVID nineteen for other countries like in Japan and uh, in Germany and America uh, the the requirement of the COVID nineteen is different but uh, recently we we listen to some people travel uh, all uh, in in some countries uh, is almost free. And uh, the only requirement for uh, for come into China is the forty eight PCR test of, of the uh, COVID nineteen. That is the only requirement. So we think as time uh, pass on, and uh, if we uh, after two or three months, I I think they may be the. Uh, the policy will be more easy for, for travelers. <clears throat> but today we, I have to say sorry to, to all the uh, faculties about the meeting because there's, there's a leadership change in, in changing. Uh, the, although we prepare for the meeting and all the neurosurgeons in Tianjin, uh, in my hospital, we are very happy and we, we, we want to hold this meeting, 
but in this way, there are some leadership changes uh, in, in our medical university and in our hospital. The president of the uh, Tianjin Medical University uh, is changed, but the, the new president uh, is not arrived, and we don't know who will be the new president. And uh, and the same same thing happened also happened in the, uh, our hospital. The hospital dean is also changed. the the old the former the former dean moved to another government position, and we also don't know who will be the new hospital dean in, uh, for, for, for us, uh, who will approve of the international activities. Uh, but this is not the most important uh, things to, to, to uh, our meeting. The most important thing is that uh, our uh, chief professor in TMU GH is also need, need a new new chief uh, professors because because the old old professor uh, Dr. Yue is retired last December and uh, because the leadership change uh, with right now in, in my department we don't have the chief uh, chief chair and of the of the of the department and. Uh, that is very important for the organizing because who will be the chair, who will be the meeting meeting chair, chairman of the ACN's meeting in Tianjin uh, in, 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 is right with, with, uh, in the Tianjin side. So last in the, in the weekend, I discussed this problem with uh, Dr. Yue and the other wise chair, chairman of, of our uh, Tianjin General Hospital, Hospital Neurosurgical Department. And we, we very deserved to want to uh, hold this meeting and, and don't want to lose these opportunities. So here I beg your pardon for the uh, unforeseeable uh, leadership changing. And uh, we, we want this meeting could be uh, held in Tianjin and uh, to be post postponed to early June, uh, maybe uh, June two to four or nine to eleven. Uh, this is the main uh, the, the main question today. I would like uh, all the faculties and uh, professors to give us a suggestion. That's that's. Uh, that's, that's my report today. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Yan? Uh, just a moment, I, I stop. Yes. Okay. Okay. I, I, I... Yeah, Dr. Yan. So uh, maybe you discuss uh, the longer uh, discussion with your uh, authority. So I think uh, this is uh, we, we are very really fine, uh, even if it's possible in yeah. June. Thank you very okay. much for great effort. And also the program contents is excellent, I think. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your thank you. Thank you very so kind much. consideration. No, my, my, thank you. We are very appreciated. Thank you very much. So once you finalize the dates, just let us know, please. Uh, I think early June, maybe uh, we can have a new chair of changes. <laughs> yes. So, uh, whether two or nine of June is okay for for, for us, but uh, I don't I don't know is what which which time which weekend is convenient for the faculties and for all other professors. So I I, I want to hear other uh, voice from other faculties. So as for the Japanese, or maybe we will check uh, the some other. Uh complexion of the other meeting i will let you know okay, okay. Uh, yes the country may be the, the boss it will be all right mm -hmm. okay yeah is there any question uh if not uh we shall move on uh, uh to the next but before that uh we we may need to also to inform prof young that we're going to have a, a web seminar in june 
uh, between three three different uh, countries. Uh, but we will inform you uh, for the date so it won't be clash uh, for both program. So thank you, Professor Yang. Uh, I would like to call our last uh, presenter, Professor Dushot, on uh, uh, on uh, seminar uh, in in Tashkent. Uh, Professor Dushot. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, can you present? Uh, actually, I have uh, sent my schedule, preliminary schedule to Sachin and Professor Kato, but I can send you directly. I have I have sent you to two, three days ago, I think. Oh. Yeah. Oh, Sachin, can you play, play the timetable, Sachin? I just, just a moment. I can see the schedule. The, is it with the word, word format? Yes, yes. So I'll open it. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Let me just do you have share. it, Do you have it or I share it? Ah, you have it, Liu? Uh, ben? Yeah, I have yeah, it. Then, then I also have this, share. I think. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Share it. Share. yeah, yeah. Is it this one? Yes, this is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. So, um, this is uh, the preliminary schedule how we are going to uh, organize our uh, symposium in Tashkent. So it's going to be um, 15, 16, and 17th uh, September. And it's going to be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So we have booked already the venue conference uh, halls. It's going to be in uh, Hotel International. Uh, it's previously called Intercontinental. So it's in the center of the uh, Tashkent. Uh, so nearby uh, many uh, other uh, hotels or the coming guests are easily can get uh, booked in the, in the same hotel. So uh, the first day is... Is going to be uh, uh, opening parallel uh, uh, live surgery going to be in a separate hall called uh, Hall Hiva, and and workshop after workshop or uh, simultaneously. Meanwhile, uh, workshop we can uh, put uh, several monitors and. Uh, hold a live surgery or watch the live surgery, which is going, which is being done in the uh, Republican Center of Neurosurgery, in, in my uh, working uh, institution. So uh, there is an, another hall called Bukhara. It's another hall is going to be a spinal session. So in general, it's going to be three sessions in first day, as these are basic uh, sessions. Uh, so with this, we are going to finish our first day. So the workshop and live surgery, uh, we have decided to put in the first day. Um, and the second day is going to be uh, vascular and the vascular functional uh, neurotrauma, preoperative management, pediatric session, and a skull base surgery and, wine, and the part of YNS session. Um, as um, the last day is going to be uh, from the uh, offer of uh, Professor Karif, he just uh, made an offer to uh, make shorter time for the last day because many guests wants to leave earlier and we decided to uh, hold the all sessions until uh, 13 or uh, 1 or 2 uh, p.m. So maximally until uh, 2 p. 
p.m. We are going to finish in the uh, third day. And the third day will be dedicated to uh, finishing the YNS session and women in neurosurgery session and award session and the closing remarks and the speech of uh, all the uh, honored professors of the Central Asia, including Professor Yakokato. And this is how we see our uh, the skeleton of our uh, symposium. So any uh, opinions, any um, proposals regarding the... Uh, I just wanted to clarify the... Uh, the opening ceremony or the starting time of the uh, sessions we have uh, put as from the 9 a.m. Uh, of course, it will be better to do to start earlier, like 8 a.m. But uh, I don't know, Professor Karif uh, thought that uh, maybe the guests are. Uh, can be uh, problematic to reach the place earlier than uh, many technical issues and preparing the Zoom uh, platform and being online available. Until this time, it, it may take some half an hour or maybe more or less. So we decided that it's going to be more convenient to start from the nine o'clock. I, I think uh, the, the short, I think it's, it's good. Yeah, okay. nine is okay, I think. That is uh, Uzbek some time. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also the many the from Central Asia can have some uh, uh, discussion or some uh, yes. time for presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And maybe, maybe and the, we, the, we, we want to, um, okay, uh, and we just wanted to uh, clarify if uh, there is a uh, exact number of coming guests to Uzbekistan, is it, is it uh, known until now or it is still unknown, we should uh, step by step uh, email them and uh, to uh, to make clear the the number of participants inside in the conference hall so i think uh, dr leif and sachin will help with the emailing the other participants the mostly the professors which are presenting mm, we have their email uh, leif dr leif sent me um so that's the uh the most important i think hey, dr Lee, uh, can send the invitation letter as soon as possible then uh, you can get the, their uh, uh the virtual or uh real uh, just you can clarify please yeah, sure, sure, Prof. Uh, I, I would send uh, uh, with, with your timetable, with this timetable. Uh, if you could share with me, then I will send together with this uh, timetable uh, as uh, for the reference of the speaker on which day they will speak on uh, and, and uh, wait for their reply. And I already sent to you the email of um, I think most 80 speakers. Uh, if you can discuss with Prof. Karen, if everything is okay, I, I could start sending the email from my side. Okay, okay, that's that will be good. Very fine. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Todd, uh, to short, can I uh, add something uh, for you? And uh, I, you, you concerning about the registration, and uh, I have um, mailed you the website and uh, the web page that uh, with the registration form uh, online. You, you can see whether you find it suitable or not. And also for the um, uh, I uh, for the functional section uh, that I mentioned that um, in your in the brochure there is uh, Professor Poon from Hong Kong uh, agreed to give a give a uh, speech in the functional section. 
So um, mm -hmm. so I just uh, let you know if, yeah. I... Okay, now I will check your registration uh, site. It's a web page uh, to my understanding. So uh, everybody should uh, register in this web page and automatically uh, we will take the list of participants, right? Yes, I, I can, yes, I can. See, uh, maybe uh, Sajjan, do you uh, think uh, it, it will work this way? Uh, I'm not sure because all the registrations will have to come to you and then you'll have to share it with the with uh, 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 Bill Shad, uh, can you do that? If you're comfortable, I'm okay with that. Yes, yes, I'm comfortable, but uh, just uh, have a uh, discussion and agreement by uh, all of us. I think let's let's keep it this way: that as long as the, the abstracts are concerned, maybe they can submit the abstract uh, to you uh, or on your website, but. As long as the registrations are concerned, uh, let there be a, a phone number of uh, Dilshad or somebody else from the uh, local secretariat. Uh, and those people who want to register, they can directly call the local registrariat and uh, uh, register uh, uh, on phone, maybe. Because. Uh... Yes, and I think, um, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm okay. Yeah, just uh, just a brief mention as mentioned by the last meeting says uh, that I need to uh, create a web web page, so uh, it's just an update that uh, this is the link that I share with you. Uh, so this, uh, can you see it now? Yeah, yes. I see it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just just to get some um, opinion from you two whether uh, this is the suitable or not. Yeah. Oh, I just have a um, simple question that uh, the, the name of the conference is um, Lithuania Centralized Research Growth Hybrid. Uh, why why it is summer seminar? I, I, I just, uh, because it's in September, I, it's going to be autumn seminar or there is no important. Yeah, I think sure. the autumn seminar is better. Yeah, then yeah. already summer finish. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I keep updating the, the site when the new details come. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, so I just want to be, be I just want to bring up one more issue uh, because uh, uh, Dr. Ben have created a, an email, email that uh, so-called official email uh, for participant uh, to communicate. Uh, and then uh, more importantly is for the speaker. Uh, I, I propose to Dr. Sachin, we're going to use the same email uh, to, to send invitation to all speakers. Uh, but uh, the important regarding Gmail, sometimes occasionally they will send a code uh, for third party user. Because sometimes they access from different countries, they will send a code. Uh, so I would suggest that if everybody agree, uh, Dr. Ben has the full access uh, to the Gmail. Uh, I would share the, the, all the speaker links. I think it's better the, the invitation sent from the email. So, and you have full access and full control of the email and he can respond immediately because I'm worried if I use a different email, it may not be appropriate. And if I control the email from my site, sometimes I will get blocked just like our SNF webinar. Occasionally I got blocked and I cannot access. So, uh, uh, Ben, is it possible? If, if possible, I, I will send the same Excel form that I sent to this shop. So once it's approved by uh, Prof Karev, we will send the invitation out immediately. Uh, possible ban from from using the same email? Yes, I, I think I think so. I think so. Yeah. For Thanks. this, Thanks, uh, uh, place, uh, I I open uh, uh, another another uh, uh, another Gmail, especially for this. So, uh, but uh, yes, I I can I can use the one that you you give me. Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ben. Thank you so much, Liu.
Uh, is there any other uh, 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 panelists who want to ask any question? Maybe uh, we can ask Dr. Tariq. Tariq? Hello. Hello. Uh, any comment? How are you doing, the, Professor? The <laughs> uh, yes, uh, yes, I I am updated uh, uh, by Diljat Mamadaliev. Yep, uh, Diljat Mamadaliev uh, uh, need any help? Uh, he can contact me uh, with me email or with WhatsApp, and I can help uh, him anyway. Okay, uh, I have your WhatsApp. Uh, I think we can Hello. Uh, communicate. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rose. Just, just to add on, yes. uh, Prof. Bishop and Professor Rick, uh, we have a few sessions that we still need a Central Asia speaker. Uh, so you would, uh, I would like both of you to look into the list and uh, propose some name for the empty spaces because we, we want that at least every session would have at least one uh, speaker from Central Asia. So probably... Uh, uh, I will share share the same uh, uh, Excel file with Professor Sarik and and I think I, I need both of you to okay. put in the name before the invitation can be sent. Yes, thanks for. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. So Abhi Rishab, okay. I want to say something because uh, Dr. Yes, Shafi. Professor Gautam. Yeah, hi, how are you, Dr. Shafi? I'm fine. Your session is missing. Yes, yes, uh, no, yes, I've, uh, I've already spoken to Professor Shafiq. I think the one that Dr. Dilshad wants, the anatomy session, right? For Central Asia. Yes, exactly. Yes, so I will I will send it to you. Can you tell me is this this is uh, only hybrid or uh, mixed for the speakers? For uh, do the speakers have to do it hybrid or online or do they have to come there physically? Or is it a choice? Uh -huh. Uh, it would be better if we can see the speakers in the site, uh, ex uh, especially those who are going to do a workshop. I mean, I, I think it's uh, impossible to do uh, online for the the ones who are doing workshop. I think they should come. No, no, I'm talking about the other sessions because the invitation. I will have to tell the speak, give them the option. That's why I was waiting. Whether we are, they can give. Whether I should give them an option of online, or should I just invite them for a physical meeting? Uh, just uh, write them that physical meeting is uh, preferably. But okay. if you cannot, then you can join online. Okay. Okay. So I'll get back to you with that in a week. I think. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vida. So, with Ali. Yeah, okay. Uh, we, we need uh, at least Professor Abida for your workshop. We have uh, a complete list for both uh, Professor uh, Kuwayama uh, workshop and uh, Professor Kimura workshop. Uh, so only your workshop, we need a uh, uh, name list. Thank, thanks. <laughs> so I'll be Abita. there. I'll be there. Don't worry. I was yeah. just talking about the other speakers. I'll be there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think if there's no uh, further question, uh, we will close the discussion and we, we decide on the next meeting uh, through the email yeah. or unless you all wish yeah. to. Uh, uh, Liu, just uh, we want to yes. ask the supervisor of the Dr. Arion and Dr. Albert, please uh, can, can. some few comments or suggestion. Arion? Yes. Well, uh, I'm always in, in awe. It's uh, always a wonderful uh, work done so i take the opportunity to to so please allow me to congratulate all of you for putting forward the wonderful agenda for the coming months i was going down through some numbers i think you have this if you would allow me to just share quickly a screen that i was uh, that's a, a visit i made just in line to uzbekistan just for the last year, I was going down the numbers. Uh, is it possible for you to see the screen that I have? Not yet. My apologies. How is it coming out? Yes, yes. Yes, we can see. It. It's, just, just... It's, it's a wonderful work that is done by the entire team and the leadership at the Asian Congress of Neuro uh, Neurological Surgeons. 
that goes uh, beyond the imaginal numbers. So if you allow me, I collected this data. I must inform you from uh, the help that you provided in recent months. And uh, the numbers continue to grow. Uh, it's an outstanding work uh, that uh, has expanded its limits. I just want to bring my, my back an historical moment. The work of uh, the Asian Congress of Neurosurgery started in 1993 that, that, that required the vision of, uh, of a man like uh, Professor Kano, but uh, it has it hasn't stopped there. It has grown enormously to expand beyond uh, the continent. And now I see that uh, that the work has expanded to numbers that are, I would say, the standard of itself. To my humble opinion, my humble and no, opinion. No, no other society in the world is par to the work that you all have put forward. So one more time to all of you, congratulations for the outstanding standards of uh, spreading the knowledge of neurosurgery beyond what it was to be the Asian Congress of Neurosurgery and now expanding to, to spaces that uh, we have not been before. So best of luck to all of you with uh, what's going to be moving forward. And uh, I thank you. Thank you all so, so very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you everyone for your support from the beginning. Thank you very much. I'm very proud of you. I'm good. Well, uh, Arion, you showed the very impressive numbers. And I think these numbers uh, come from, uh, of course, uh, the vision of Professor Yoko Kato but also uh, from uh, uh, the tireless uh, work of uh, many young Asian neurosurgeons. Uh, so we really must be grateful, not only to Professor Kato, but also to people like uh, Raja, Liu, uh, Sachin, uh, and all the speakers uh, uh, we heard today, and the, the people who are organizing such wonderful and important events. I think uh, uh, I also want to congratulate uh, these friends uh, who are organizing congresses and hands-on. Uh, really, I, I know it's a huge effort you you must put on this uh, uh, organization. Uh, but I think it's important, especially now after the pandemic, people want to gather, uh, want to be in the same place. So it's very important. Uh, I think the programs... Uh, of the congresses uh, which are being organized uh, uh, are wonderful. Uh, actually, uh, this should, if I if I may ask you about uh, the uh, neuroanatomy session, uh, are you aiming to to perform a specific uh, uh, topics on neuroanatomy or is it in general? And same about uh, workshops. Are you focusing on specific? Uh, uh, procedures. Um, thank you, Alberto. Uh, actually, uh, we have considered it as, as general topics, but uh, if there is any specific uh, suggestions regarding the, uh, like, it's highly, uh, highly evaluated uh, topics, like, uh, of course, uh, Topics like glioma or uh, endoscopic treatment is very highly appreciated. Uh, we can we can choose the specific topics also, I think. But it is general, mostly yeah. for uh, YNS. Yes. Yeah. Uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, program. Uh, and same uh, congratulations to Professor Yang and uh, for the organizers of uh, the Bangladesh uh, meeting. Really. <laughs> Impressive job. Congratulations. So just a note, I want to make sure that Dr. Andreas do uh, endoscopic spine surgery. I think uh, he does, but I have to check. Yeah, please, because uh, the this shot uh, has a lot of injuries of the endoscopic spine surgery. So that's why. <laughs> I will check and let you know. Yeah, please, let, let him know, please. Sure. Any 
Is there anybody else who want to speak? Uh, Yang Sensei? If, Dr. Yang Sensei, you want to say something or some comment for another the Congress? Please unmute. Sorry, Arbus. Thank you, uh, Arbus. Thank you very much. <laughs> I see a lot of wonderful works ACS have done under the direction of Professor Kato. And uh, we are very, very honored if we can continue to hold the TNG meeting. We really want to uh, have the meeting uh, to be uh, hold, to be uh, accomplished uh, successfully. So uh, other professors and uh, leaders of Tianjin Neurosurgery expanding all the uh, faculties could be gathered in Tianjin. We can see each, each other in person. So maybe in the summer of this, this year, we can see in each other in, in China. Uh, I think the policy of COVID-19 may be canceled at yeah. that time. Welcome everybody to change it. Welcome. Thank you, Professor. That's my words. Thanks. Dr. Yan, you want to introduce your colleagues, uh, your, uh, the junior colleagues. Uh, I, I don't know his name. I forgot his name, sorry. Dr. Yan. Uh -huh. Can yeah. you introduce uh, your oh. junior? Yeah. Your yeah. Wait, wait, which person, professor? No, someone which person who, you, you are talking? No, someone who is attending from the beginning. <clears throat> the, the your maybe colleagues, I think. Uh, uh, Dr. Liu, that, do you know his name? Uh, his professor Zhang. Yeah, uh, uh, Professor Zhang. Is he, he was here, I think, just now. Zhang. Is something? Uh, Professor Zhang is Zhang. here. Uh, Professor Zhang. 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 Zhang Nai is here. Yeah. Dr. Zhang in my department. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Zhang. yes. He, he's here. Yeah, you want I'm to here. speak, uh, Professor? Hello, everyone. So everything good for you? Uh, no, no, no. It's okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Yang has uh, reported our works uh, we have done. Uh, and uh, uh, I, we will uh, continue uh, to prepare the meeting and uh, uh, welcome uh, all professors to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Mm. Uh, Matron, Matron Yi, uh, are you attending? I don't think so, so okay. Uh, oh. Yes, Prof. Yes, hi, how are you? So you want to say something? Hi. Good evening, everybody. It's yes. such a wonderful meeting. With uh, I think everyone is ready to uh, get ready with all a lot of wonderful programs on uh, hybrid and online. I, I do hope... Uh, we nurses uh, able to contribute during the, all these meetings. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. So this shot, uh, is it possible to the Central Asia, the nurse can make one session? Is it possible? Yes. Yes, yes it's, it's possible, no problem. We just should collect the uh, speakers from the nurses. Yes. Uh, from Central Asia, we we will uh, conduct this from uh, with Pro Professor Serik, uh, and from Central, uh, maybe from Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, we can we can take like five six nurses. I think it's possible. Maybe the uh, Mrs. E, so you can uh, lead the, his uh, uh, comment, please. Okay. Do you say? Uh, yes. Uh, I think, uh, anyone else? I just uh, yes, just check back. I think Professor Yang, we, we maybe we have a web uh, uh, seminar on June of third. Uh, so probably you may consider uh, the second week of the June uh, for the postponement of the entry meeting. But I think we confirmed by Professor Kato later. Uh, if there's no further uh, question discussion, uh, we will uh, close uh, the meeting. And uh, thank you to everyone. Uh, probably we get closing remark from Professor Kato before we close oh. the session. Yeah.
this one is fine. So Abira wa wants to say something. Abira on Ashish wants to say something. No, Ashish. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, so maybe the, I wish that every congress will be very successful, the nice one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you.